Hello da, bonjour and willkommen to the Total Football Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm, I'm joined by a man who is terrified of all those languages. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. The languages and the delivery. I felt like I was being interrogated for a moment there. I was, more, I was interrogating myself in terms of languages. All right. Because the first team we'll be talking about in Group G mm-hmm. is Belgium. Belgium has three official languages, Dutch, French, German. Yep. Yeah. I like it. And did you notice the, uh, the, the new title for the show I slipped in? I did not. The Total Football Show. Oh, I yeah. see. It's not like Voitball or whatever? No, or is that just football Dutch? because okay. later in today's show, uh-huh. we'll be discussing England. Ah, of course. The England national football team. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got to make a confession first. I thought we'd be talking about England first. Did you I really? I forgot. You thought they were the seeded team? England are not the seeded team in this group. They're the also-ran European team. Mm. They are the seeded team heartbreaking. in the mediocre uh, pot, Ooh. I think. Is that correct? Are we getting Burns in early? <laughs> oh. A little bit, a little bit. All right, but I'm, I am looking forward to talking England with yep. you later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Shall we start we with should. Belgium in our penultimate World Cup preview? Group G. Yeah. So as you said, it's Belgium. And as you alluded to earlier, they've got a couple different names. The English one would be the Red Devils, but you've got De Rote Duvel, uh, Les Diables Rouge, and uh, De Roten Teffel. All right. Something we're not, like that. We're not going to say everything in three languages though, right? Hey, man. Hey, I'm trying to be culturally appropriate, <laughs> uh-huh. Daryl. Thank you very much. But anyway, it's the Red Devils, or as I've chosen to nickname them, the Dark Horses. Because that's oh. what they are. So are, they, a, aren't they too I'm saying, I'm saying the horses. perennial dark horses is my nickname for them. <laughs> the perennial dark horses. So this is hardcore dark horse, though, where it's not like, oh, I think they'll get to the quarterfinals. This is dark horse as in this team could win it all. Yep. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. I think so. I, I, but I, I did have, I was at a wedding this weekend. Several people ask, asked me who, like, who the underdog was. And multiple times another person jumped in to say, like, it's Belgium, right? It's got to be Belgium. So I feel like that is the sort of mm-hmm. reputation they have. Well, we'll find out later the answer is Panama. <laughs> Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's because they're always considered the underdog. And I would still still say, even though they have the talent they have and they're as deep as they are, there is still this weird, like, yeah, but can they put it all together? Because they are usually the underdogs, and now they're the dark horses. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's dig into this a little mm-hmm. more then. Before we get to tactics and sure. all that stuff, um, Euro 2016 was an example of you look at the roster, you look mm-hmm. at the depth of talent, you get very excited, Eden Hazard and all that. Um, Mark Wilmot's in charge. I didn't have time that, to that, that, was, that was less exciting. That was less exciting. Mark Vilmot's in charge, yeah. and then it was an unexciting tournament, an unimpressive tournament for Belgium. Why do we think it will be any different this time around? Sure. Uh, <laughs> first, I will say I'm not sure it will be. Ooh. Yes, I think uh, I think Roberto Martinez is certainly a better manager than Mark Vilmot mm-hmm. was, and is much more of a unifying manager. But that is sort of easy to say if you have a person who is constantly creating infighting and berating players and publicly airing uh, uh, grievances. Then if you don't do those things, you are, by definition, better at at not doing those things. So let's back up a bit Mm -hmm. and talk about Roberto Martinez then. Sure. Because he's not Belgian. Mm-mm. Spanish coach, yep. former Everton coach. Who my my memory of him, mm-hmm. um, his time at Everton is that even though it all went wrong towards the end, everybody loved him as a person. Yes, I right? mean, except for Everton fans, who I think felt a little frustrated. Well, they they by didn't the like way. his tactics, yeah. but I think they liked the human. Yes, I yeah. think that is the case. I think we've heard nothing but good things from him, both in terms of his managerial career and as a pundit. Yeah, it has always He's been good on ESPN, isn't he? Yeah, even even when he was struggling with Wigan, even when Wigan were relegated, the narrative was sort of always, yeah, but with a bigger team, this wouldn't be happening. Mm-hmm. Then he gets Everton the first season; everybody's in love. The second season kind of flames out, and now he's with Belgium. <laughs> Why is he with Belgium? Why did they go for Roberto Martinez after he was fired at Everton to be the manager of this Mm all-star Belgium team? Uh, I think, first of all, he's not a manager who's ever necessarily been afraid of challenges. I think he has been happy to take on difficult managerial positions. But I also think the way Everton ended, it was always going to be difficult for him to get another, quote-unquote, high-profile club gig. I think he probably could have gotten a job in England. He definitely could have gotten a job in the championship. He probably could have moved elsewhere. But I'm not sure the profile he was looking for would have been met by some clubs. But what I'm saying is Belgium, Mm -hmm. after you were 2016, getting rid of Vilmart. Yeah. All that talent, you would think they would have gone for, you know, Pep ah, Guardiola. I think you're, <laughs> you know I mean? I I think think you're saying, go, why would he go to no, Belgium? You're saying, why, why would, would Belgium go for him? Yes. The answer there is because the Belgian FA does not have the amount of money you might think they do. The Belgian League is not that strong. Um, and so you don't necessarily have the ability to spend the type of money it would take to get right. one of those top-tier managers or even a second-tier manager because – 
to get somebody with that proven track record who's at that sort of level that Belgium would be looking for, you're mm-hmm. going to have to spend a decent amount, amount. Roberto Martinez was probably the cheapest option they had. So before we move on from Roberto Martinez, mm-hmm. I'd like to do my physical descriptions. I also don't coaches. think you've given us your nickname yet either. I oh, know, we'll get to okay. it. We'll okay, okay. Um, so Roberto Martinez, in case mm-hmm. you're wondering, um, especially with the, he now has sort of a shaved head, mm-hmm. right? He's got then the shaved balding head look. Um, when he's concentrating, yep. he looks like an international hitman mm-hmm. studying the envelope. <laughs> with his target in it. When he's smiling, he looks like yeah. a Spanish stand-up comedian entertaining the crowd. He really does have yep. a, a very serious, scary look and a very friendly, big, smiley look. Yeah, yeah, I agree with so that. That's Roberto Martinez. I agree with both of those things. <laughs> I agree with both of those things. My nickname mm-hmm. for Belgium, the nickname I think they should have, is the Switcheroos. Okay. The Switcheroos. Because they like to, under Martinez, they uh-huh. play this 3-4-3 three, they spread out wide. They always have their left wing back slash left mid, wide left. Their right mid, right wing back, wide right. We'll get into the personnel in a minute. And they stretch the field out. And then they will work the ball from all the way from the left all the way to the right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes a big, long switch ball. Most often, short passes all the way across. They will switch at the side of the field repetitively mm-hmm. to stretch you out. Yep. They are the switcheroos. They are the switcheroos. <laughs> okay. I like it. But my question for you then is do you share – my sort of trepidation about Roberto Martinez because... Not specifically about Martinez, more just about mm-hmm. Belgium having watched them play. Okay. Yeah, which so, I, I suppose reflects poorly-ish on Martinez. So what do you mean then? Uh, so what I don't like about them mm-hmm. um, is... And there's, there's lots of stuff I do like about them, which yeah. we'll get into. But I still think defensively, because they stretch you out, when they concede possession, they are stretched out. Mm-hmm. And they're not great at the counter-pressing type thing, you know, like they win the ball back as soon as you lose it. I see them try to scramble backwards after they lose the ball, but they scramble backwards from a stretched out yep. formation and there are gaps there. Yep. And I've also, I've taken a good look at their back line when they're trying to defend. It's often not a straight line, which is a little bit scary. I'm not, I'm not sure they're very good at holding a defensive line. That said, a lot of the games I watch, Vincent Company was not there. Mm-hmm. And I feel like maybe when Vincent Company plays central of the back three, yeah. he will have the experience and nous to organize everybody. The other thing I'm scared about is those wing backs. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll, we'll talk more about it, but it's uh, Thomas Mounier probably on the right, Yannick Carrasco on the left. Um, they can get isolated. They can really get, you can get in behind them. You can get, you can overload and go two on one versus them. So I have lots of defensive worries about Belgium, but I'm looking forward to watching their games. Well, while we've noted that, I'm going to go ahead and jump to my prediction, my first prediction, which yes. is that Belgium will concede because Yannick Carrasco failed to drop back and track his runner. There we go. Uh, yes, because I am fully on board with that one. So and le- I d- left mid slash, would you call him a left winger, left wing back or left back? Or left left wing back, I yeah, think. Left yeah. wing back. Um, and I think it's because he is not a natural defender. That's mm-hmm. why I'm sort of looking at him. I mean, he is, we saw him play many times for Atletico Madrid as a wide midfielder. Yep. So to see him trying to play this more defensive role, I think even if he's working very hard, his inclination is always to get forward and be involved in the attack. And I think you can see moments where he gets forward, does a really good thing, but maybe his cross goes to the goalkeeper or the header goes to the goalkeeper and you'll see him sort of jog back the way a midfielder would, not necessarily realizing that he's a wing back and he needs to be way back. He reminds me of a guy who has a creative job at a magazine. Let's say he's the graphic designer at a magazine and he loves all the creative stuff like putting the magazine and the the images Mm -hmm. together. But there's, say, 20% of his job that is admin Mm -hmm. that he hates doing, but he has to do it to keep the job. And that is the tracking back part for Carrasco. And then I think maybe some of the admin, there are typos or the spreadsheets don't work properly when Carrasco's uh, in this job. I would say I would continue your analogy to be (laughs) that then he has two or three partners who have to come in and do the admin for him, (laughs) but then they're doing their own admin and other people's admin as well. Those two would uh, most commonly be... Uh, Jan Vertonghen and Vincent Company are the yeah. two that I saw kind of consistently having to slide over and cover. Jan Vertonghen, we expect, will be the left center back yes. in that back three. Uh, Vincent Company, if he's fit, will be the center center back. Mm-hmm. But if Vertonghen has to move over to cover that gap, then Company slides with him. Then so, it's incumbent upon a defensive midfielder to drop in. And suddenly there's a lot of moving parts that have to be adjusted if Carrasco does drift momentarily. So Vertonghen would be like the guy who was a full-time admin yep. and he's having to do 43 hours a week or more to cover up for Carrasco's mistakes. There's another reference I was about to make, but 
it's going to come up later on. So I'll just leave it for now. I'll <laughs> okay. leave it for now. Let's focus on mm-hmm. the positive. So sure. Uh, the positives of Yannick Carrasco, because mm-hmm. the reason that Roberto Martinez is willing to take a gamble on a guy who is not in any way, shape or form a left back yeah. as his left wing back is that he does offer a lot going forward. He yes. is nice and direct. He will run at people. He has a wicked shot from distance, mm-hmm. right? So there's a lot going on with Yannick Carrasco that makes him worth including in your team, even if it's a bit of a gamble. I would agree with that. I think the not to stay negative for a moment, because I'll go like po- like compliment sandwich if possible. But you go back to Vomit and a big thing that I remember. Pa- Pazneg, pause? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> Pazneg? I think he played for a team a while ago. <laughs> um, but I would say that like we remember uh, for the 2016 Euros, for the 20, even for the 2014 World Cup, I think, you had four center backs playing as your four yep. defensive players. Mm-hmm. and That was Vilmot's original sin. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, it's less covered in the Bible. <laughs> uh, but I think what you have with Martinez is maybe the opposite. It's him looking at his team, putting them in a position to, I think, play attacking soccer and be exciting to watch. But I think part of that is I want to get the best possible talent into this team, yes. and I'm going to put them where I can. So Yannick Carrasco, maybe he should be playing left wing, but we don't really have a left wing, and even if we did, there'd be other players who maybe I'd want to put there. So let's put him at left wing back, and, mm-hmm. and we'll make up for his shortcomings because he offers so much going forward. But that's the thing that I kind of can't shake with this Belgium team, is that when you're assembling a team because of the talent and not necessarily because it makes sense, that's where I start to wonder if something goes wrong, how do they respond? Fair enough. One final word on Yannick Carrasco. Mm-hmm. He plays in China. Yep. He was 24, mm-hmm. coming towards the peak-ish of his powers at Atletico Madrid yep. in January or so of this year. Took a big move to China for big money, and mm-hmm. it was a real weird... It really took me by surprise. I mean, I, th- I think it was the situation that Atletico needed the income from the transfer. I think they made like three or four transfers to China in mm-hmm. that window. Get- Nicholas Gaetan went as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Uh, but I actually have Carrasco as a player who I think, it, with a strong World Cup, we could see do the... I'm going to call it do the Polino and get a move <laughs> back to Europe, get a move back to a stronger team. But does he want it? I mean, I don't know. Or is That's he just happy question. taking mm-hmm. all the Chinese money? I mean, yeah, because I think Atletico were happy. At- Atletico. I can never get that strongly enough pronounced for people not to still be like, it's not Atletico. I know. <laughs> uh, I think they were happy to take that money. I think Carrasco, yeah, probably was happy to take that payday. But maybe at a certain point, I think when you want more money and you get more money, you're very excited. But then there can come that point when you're like, yeah, I make more money. But maybe I want to go and do something else. I've just realized as well, he's a big winner here because moving to China mm-hmm. the what, six months before a World Cup is a huge risk. Yep. Right? You very much risk losing your place in a very talented uh, Belgium 23. Mm-hmm. He finds himself in the starting 11 after making that weird move. So yeah. and that's, well done, Yannick Carrasco. Yeah. Sort of. Well, I think also from everything I've heard about Roberto Martinez, he is very involved. And I don't mean like, like uh, inserts himself into situations. I just mean that I think – weren't you telling me the story about how he and his wife – like their together time is that she watches TV while he watches like what he needs to watch on headphones. Mm-hmm. But at least they're together so in the same room. Here's the, it's this from the Grant Wall Masters yeah. of Modern I know I've referenced it a couple of times, but Grant did a good job of selecting interviewees who would be at the World Cup, yep. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, instead of arguing over Roberto needs to watch soccer, Roberto's wife wants to watch something else, they put two TVs back to back, got a sort of L or U-shaped couch, so they could each watch TV from separate sides but still be together. Sure. That's a really good yeah. solution. And he still has the, the basement facility where he has access to all of the, like, the data analytics services where mm-hmm. he can go back and rewatch footage. All of that is to say that I would not be surprised at all if Roberto Martinez was involved in those conversations when Carrasco went abroad. Not oh, from a, like, here's maybe. my thoughts here, but more so, you're yeah. in my plans, you moving six months isn't going to factor too much. I wouldn't be surprised if he was heavily involved in those conversations. Here's an interesting thing I've just remembered. So Roberto Martinez does have access to all that data. Mm-hmm. He's into stats and he's like, you know observant of other teams. But he seems to only use it for attacking purposes. So mm-hmm. if you think the flip side is like Jose Mourinho, right? We'll watch the opposition and we'll say, all right, we're scared of this guy. We'll have three men man mark him mm-hmm. or something. Not actually that, but you know what I'm saying? He'll make a yeah. defensive move based on what he's seen. I wouldn't be surprised if he said that um, before. In that chapter of the book, Roberto Martinez finds a weakness in the opposition and adjusts accordingly to to go after the opposition. So I think that's more Roberto Martinez's move. He's a more attacking, let's find a way to win this game kind of coach. Yes. That's going to make Belgium thrilling. It also could be their downfall when they play a stronger team. Fair? We, fair. We have already gotten like some people... Saying nice but sort of tongue in cheek teasing comments about how long our previews have been and how yeah. in depth. And I do think that only you and I 
could spend like 10 minutes talking about Belgium and it would be about Roberto Martinez and Yannick Carrasco. So maybe we should talk about some other people on this team. We're not trying to be sort I know, of hipster. We're, we're not, but right? it's where it's where I mean, we found this in other groups the and other teams. What it wants to yeah, I mean, we we tend to migrate towards the same spots. I'm not, yeah. so I wasn't surprised that we both ended up on <laughs> Yannick Carrasco and the opportunities he present, presents, but the vulnerabilities that he also creates. All right, well, let's get us to the uh, sure. the star power, the forward line, with my first prediction. Sure, Romelu Lukaku is going to score all the goals. Now, do you mean literally or figuratively there? I mean figuratively. Okay. I think he'll get at least four in the group stage, because partly because of the standard of opposition, mm-hmm. but maybe he'll put quite a few past Panama, more on that later. Yep. Uh, but also because Romelu Lukaku is the central striker in this, I'm going to call it a 3-4-3, but it's really a 3-4-2-1, right? Yep. With two attacking midfielders, Eden Hazard, the Eden Hazard, uh, and Dries Mertens, mm-hmm. uh, who's sort of like the other Eden Hazard, underneath <laughs> Romelu Lukaku. Um, and then with Carrasco and Moon on the right with Kevin De Bruyne feeding him I think Lukaku is I think people underrate how smart he is at finding space making decisions communicating Mm -hmm. with teammates he's my favourite gesturer in all of world soccer. <laughs> you know how many times you see him not just give a thumbs up yeah. to uh, a teammate for a good pass or whatever, but literally put his hand out and point to where he wants the ball to be played. He is constantly doing that. Mm-hmm. He will be finding the space. He will be on the end of things. I agree. It's a nice little slipped in pass, whether it's a, um, a, a cross from deep that mm-hmm. he's going to challenge for, or whether it's been on the end of a, a rebound from a keeper, like he scored recent. I can't remember which game it was, but uh, Hazard shot from distance. I someone think that saved was Costa Rica. Costa Rica. And Lukaku was there to finish it. He's yep. a deadly finisher. I think this is Lukaku's World Cup to fill his boots with goals. I think he is a very good finisher. Everything you said is accurate. The one thing I would add on to it is that he's a very good finisher when there are lots of opportunities. Not to say that he misses them, but that I think if he doesn't get, if he gets more than like one or two a game, then suddenly if he's got chance after chance after chance, I think he's a player who relies on flow and that flow Mm. state. And once he gets into it, I think he is far more capable of scoring a hat trick once he's gotten two or three shots in the first 15 minutes. And I do think think that's what Belgium are set up for a little bit is to give so many attacking options so many opportunities and I think he'll be one to benefit from them the thing I have for Romelu Lukaku which I think is one of like the best parts of Belgium in my opinion to watch is the way that they break uh, and I feel like they do a specific thing which is uh, and that's where my second prediction is that Romelu Lukaku we both have Lukaku scoring goals good to see again similar pages it's gonna happen right? I have him scoring a fast break header and what I mean by this is that it seems like it's usually either uh, Aiden Hazard or Kevin De Bruyne will pick the ball up at midfield dribble past somebody play the ball out wide to an advancing wing back that wing back will take one touch that goes about 50 or 20 yards ahead of him, then they will cross it to Romelu Lukaku, who has made a near post sprint. Like wait, it's wait, a wait. very specific pattern of play. The wing back will take a touch that goes 15 or 20 yards because ahead. Because they have so much space, because oh, they do. Not because they have a terrible first touch. No, because they do the switcheroo and they swing yes. it to the other side where there is that space because that wing back has sat back and mm-hmm. now catapulted forward. But Lukaku, I've noticed with Belgium, is so good as soon as that touch is taken of making that check away run to the far post but then crashing near post and getting on the end of it and then he meets that with like it's like a driven cross with a towering header and he bullets that thing into the back of the net and a driven cross doesn't need a lot of say neck strength or snap to Mm -hmm. just he's got the technique right to just redirect it I imagine it in the the near top corner Mm -hmm. yep yeah so you've got that like the wide player stretching and then you've got Romelu Lukaku smashing that header in so I agree with you I think he's going to score some goals but I'm saying specifically a header off of a (laughs) fast break counter (laughs) and while we're talking about stretching um so I said at the top of the show... It's important before you play. It is. Carrasco pulling left, Mounier pulling right. Make sure that the opposition can't get too compact because mm-hmm. you're going to have players way out wide each way. The, the secondary effect of that is... Eden Hazard, who's like the left attacking midfielder, and Dries Merton, the right attacking midfielder, it means that they don't have to worry about going out wide. They have all that space in mm-hmm. the interior to receive the ball and run at people. Yep. And it's really, really helpful. Sometimes, though, you will see them pull... The other reason they're the switcheroos is that sometimes Hazard and Carrasco will flip. So mm-hmm. it's almost like a design thing where Carrasco will come inside and Hazard will go outside. I yep. think it's designed to confuse defenders so they don't know who to follow or where to go. So there's lots of tricky stuff going on with Belgium's attacking front. I'm going to say three... 14. 
14, <laughs> there you go. Well, everyone except the back three yep. and one defensive midfielder mm-hmm. that might be, say, Moussa Dembele. So let's talk about that for a second because yeah. I'm not sure who it will be. I would agree with you the that if I were picking, it would be uh, Moussa Dembele. But, uh, Next to Kevin De Bruyne? That's what I yeah, expect. Two to, I think that's what they'll do against weaker opposition where they feel like they can get goals early and often. Yeah. I think those will be your two center mids, except that it seems like uh, Axel Witzel is the one that Roberto Martinez... Uh, favors Axel Witzel mm-hmm. also playing in China, yeah. Uh, and but it seems like that's the one who he starts more regularly, and I and I just I'm a little surprised by that. That's that's one of the players that Raja Nangalan singled out for criticism when he wasn't included in the roster. Meaning that he's got my spot. I think basically, I think yeah. he said like I think he was very frustrated that in the past Roberto Martinez had said he wanted to see players challenge themselves in playing at the top level, <laughs> then to suddenly inclu- include include two China, players playing in meant. China. Yeah, exactly, exactly. He just wanted them in the top flight. No uh-huh. second division teams are allowed. Actually, I think. When Carrasco joined, mm-hmm. they were in the second division. They just got promoted. I can't remember the name of the team. Is no, it? no second division teams actively right now. I don't know. I don't know what it could be. But I, Dalian but, Yifang, by the way, I always yes. feel bad. Keep saying mm-hmm. the Chinese team, the Chinese team. Dalian Yifang. Oh, free is Yannick Carrasco, and then Axel yes. Witzel is uh, Tianjin. Tianjin Quanjian. Yeah. I apologize to all of our many Chinese listeners and Chinese speakers. I don't. I tried my best. Mandarin speakers, I suppose. Um, well done. Um, but I think. I think I would be more comfortable if I were a Belgium fan, which I'm not, but if I were, uh, with Moussa Dembele starting. Maybe that's just because of my familiarity with him from the Premier League, but I think he probably has been playing at, he has been playing at a higher standard, more competitively. It makes more sense, in my opinion, to start, but maybe uh, Axel Witzel is just one of those Martinez guys. I just kind of love Moussa Dembele. Mm-hmm. I love his ability to not get the ball taken off of him, either through strength or dribbling. I think mm-hmm. he has one of, he's one of those people that looks like they have glue on their shoes. The ball just yep. sticks to his foot, and it's impossible to relieve him of it. So I like him for that reason. Yes. Um, I, I also think one, one more note on those two central midfielders. I think there's also a decent chance Dries Mertens uh, is, has been playing uh, as a center forward for Napoli. He's been far more central for Belgium. Yes. He'll be maybe a wider sort of, like as you said, one well, of those two. Well, he'd be like behind Lukaku yeah. alongside Hazard. In the 3-4-2-1. Yeah. Yeah. There's also In, inside right. It's basically like almost like the old-fashioned yeah. front five. Right? He's the inside right. Yeah. But I think there's a chance that against stronger opposition, if they need more midfield steel, then you will see Witzel and Dembele starting, and you'll see Kevin De Bruyne pushed ahead removing Mertens. Uh, Mertens. Yeah. But I think that could be a problem because from a lot of what I read, it sounds like maybe there's a Kevin De Bruyne, Aiden Hazard is similar to the Steven Gerrard, Frank Lampard. Of They both do very similar things do and they? want to occupy similar space, at least when playing for Belgium, that they basically they make similar runs, they have similar ideas about how to play, and that can be problematic. That's interesting. I don't think of them as being that similar. Because I think do of I. Hazard as farther mm-hmm. forward and running at people yep. and you don't know if he's going to go left or right and everybody is ter- justly terrified mm-hmm. of him. Whereas I think of De Bruyne as more of a deeper lying schemer, right? I See, I agree with you. I think that's what he is recently, like specifically once, like since moving to Manchester City or becoming such a prominent player for mm-hmm. Man City. But I think historically... Since Guardiola, basically. For, yeah, basically. But for Belgium, I think when they've played in that same spot, because maybe De Bruyne wants to be doing the deeper job, but I when see. they play together, it just doesn't work as well. Got it. So that will be another interesting wrinkle. But again, that's why I'm just sort of, I'm sort of uncertain about yeah. Belgium, more so than I thought I would be. Well, if all goes to plan, mm-hmm. then my second prediction is a Kevin De Bruyne counter-attacking assist. This may be yep. similar to your Lukaku um, like fast break mm-hmm. header, um, but Kevin De Bruyne to me is one of the best players in a counter- to have in a counter attacking move. Yep, because he confidently and precisely plays long high balls that land exactly where they need to go. I just trust him to do um, a long defense breaking pass in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Like he know he spots when an opposition defense is all out of sorts and out of shape and knows exactly where to land the ball to cause maximum damage. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes like when I'm playing, I see that ball, I'm like, yeah, let's play this. But then it's seven yards too far to the left and 12 yards uh, too far forward. Or, yeah. you know, just way, way off. De Bruyne lands it on a dime every single time. Yep. So he will lead a counterattack in that way and get himself an assist. I agree. Yeah. I think that's that's a very good shout. The only thing that I want to add on to all of this is... We seem to be implying that they're going to play a lot on the break, and I think they're capable of doing that. But I've also seen them be very capable of having lots of possession 
in their opponent's defensive third. Yes. And so the other one, I don't know if it, I've already done my two predictions. This could be a bonus prediction or not. But I was going to add that I think Belgium will complete more passes inside the opposition 18 than any other team in the group stage. Inside the opposition 18? I saw so much of are it in a friendly. at that point, though? You definitely are. But it's the it's the Man City thing is what I'm going to call it, where okay. it's just that pass, 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 pass. And eventually we'll shoot when the situation presents itself. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you get impatient shooters. But I just <laughs> couldn't. Crash go. I couldn't. Crash yeah. go from distance. But they just... <laughs> They're they're one of those teams where they're inside your 18 and they're still trying to pass and move and find little spots and there's little flicks and there's little tricks, but then they will recycle back out wide and they'll they're, come back around. They're just waiting for Lukaku to point where he wants it. That's a possibility. <laughs> but I just I I was I made note of how often they just completed like three and four pass sequences mm-hmm. inside the opponent's 18, and it was just something that I couldn't stop trying to find when I was watching them. Yeah, it's so maybe it was me trying to look for it and find it, but I felt like no, if I could there. find I've three or four it. examples, yeah. then... And again, the other example, not the example, the other danger is mm-hmm. that they are the team that gets counted up, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the one who doesn't knock. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if De Bruyne is trying to play a too clever pass and yep. someone, even if it's like Roman Torres for Panama, gets in the way of it, there's a chance that they've pushed so many people forward, they can, they can go out and mm-hmm. they'll be in trouble. Yep. Yeah. Anything else on Belgium before we move on to sort of young player to Just, watch and reason to support? Uh, yeah, I, I would say yeah, it, it's, it. it's it's interesting what a difference two years or four years makes because I remember, I think it was even two years ago with the Euros that we were talking about, is it going to be Lukaku or is it going to be Christian Benteke? That question has been answered. Mm-hmm. Same thing. It was kind of a debate of is it Thibaut Courtois or is it Simon Mignolet at that time? It really? is very much Thibaut. I remember that having that conversation on the show. Yeah, with Liverpool about, fans? Mm, I think I think it was when Mignolet was still new enough that it was like a grace period. Okay. But um, it will be Thibaut Courtois. He's quite good. We all know that. It will not be Christian Benteke as a backup. It will be uh, Michi Batshuayi. Yep. And he is the other I'm player. I'm a huge fan of Michi Batshuayi's social media yep. interactions. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, and I think he is the other player on this team who could get a move this summer. I think he probably needs one uh, because you've got Morata, you've got Giroud at Chelsea. Yeah. It seems like maybe he's not in the plans. We'll see what happens if and when Sarri comes in. But Batshuayi, 24, back at Chelsea, 10 goals, uh, ten games, 7 goals for Dortmund last season. It seems like he kind of established that he can play at a high level mm-hmm. consistently and play well. I think a couple goals in this tournament are just coming in and being an impact sub, maybe getting that third game, who knows. It could help pave the way for a move this summer. So worth noting on Batshuayi, I would say the major difference between him and Lukaku is Batshuayi is a bit more fleet of foot. Yeah, I'd agree Batshuayi with that. Is, to me is someone who can just skip away and accelerate in a way that Lukaku can't quite... Not Lukaku's slow, but it's a different thing, right? He doesn't leave people for dead in the yeah. way that I think Batshuayi can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair? You, fair. Ma- you very briefly mentioned Thibaut Courtois. We may have people listening yeah. who are not f- familiar with Thibaut Courtois, right? Yep. Chelsea goalkeeper, six foot 100. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Big, the, my, the image I have in my head when I think of Thibaut Courtois is either coming and claiming crosses very easily... Or big, long, stretched out save. Yep. It's almost like he can lay down. He's and got co- go-go gadget arms. Right, yeah, yeah, it's like he can cover the entire mm-hmm. goal. I think maybe he dislocates his shoulder when he dives and pops, yeah, it, out. Out. Yeah. pops it out another 10 inches. Yeah, yeah. that's how it works. That's yeah, probably you, you not pop it out and you just throw it that way. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then you just get Vincent Company to slam it back in. True. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you'll have him back there. Uh, I'm not so worried about their goalkeeping uh, because Me neither. Thibaut Courtois is very good. The only other vulnerability that I spotted, whether or not it is actually a vulnerability, who knows, is that we've got the back three, as we said, Jan Vertonghen, Vincent Company, Toby Alderweireld. There's questions about Vincent Company. If about his fitness, yeah. If you have multiple injuries, you've got Diedrich Boyata, you've got Thomas Vermeulen. That's it for your defensive cover. Vermeulen's no stranger to the uh, treatment table. This either, is true. Right? So maybe maybe if something went very wrong, if you had maybe yellow card accumulation and an injury and something else, then you've maybe got Musa Dembele dropping in. But it's not an issue they're going to want to deal with, is my <sighs> guess. That's a little bit scary. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Who's your young player to watch? Young player who might shine and earn themselves a transfer somewhere else. I mean, I think I already... I mean, basically, it's Batshuayi. He's only 24, uh, but he's a young player who I think could get the move. Same thing for Carrasco, also mm-hmm. 24 years old. That makes sense. Okay, I also want to spotlight uh, Yuri Tielemans, mm-hmm. um, a player we've been tracking for a long time through yep. the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. He's still only 21. I really think he's got it all. Um, but he's had a rough year he at has. Monaco. He's combative, uh, talented midfielder. I, I like him to, liken him to uh, a slightly more refined Weston McKenney. <laughs> That feel about right? A bit more polished. Like two years more polished, Weston McKinney. I think I don't know because we've gotten uh, Steve Renard scouting Yuri Tielemans mm-hmm. for the Scouting Network. Like his, his the reports. It's not that they've been bad reports. They've been interesting and well written reports. No, he's had a but, rough year. But they're kind of consistently like, oh yeah, he didn't close that down. He didn't track that one. He didn't get back in time. 
I don't think you would ever say those things about Weston McKinney. I can't imagine <laughs> saying like, oh, yeah, he failed to track back. So I think there are some deficiencies in his game. Certainly he can improve them. He's only 21. But I, I might object to the, right. uh, the polishness. All right. You don't like Tillemans? I'm throwing a piece of paper away. <laughs> Next up, um, maybe Leander Dendonka. You familiar sure. with Leander Dendonka? So he is – so Monaco is a big club that Tillemans at, right? But Dendonka is at Anderlecht. You didn't he's throw the paper far. He's still in the Belgian <laughs> league. Um, I need to make it an airplane to yeah. make it go far. Um, so he's still in the Belgian league. He's a big defensive midfielder. He is great on the ball, can spray passes around. I watched some footage of him at Anderlecht. Sometimes he was in the middle of the back three. So if there is that defensive crisis right. you were talking about, Leander Dendonka, it's a fun name to say, could be – that spare man in the back three, mm-hmm. possibly, maybe, and could get a move from Anderlecht. 21 years old. Other one worth noting, maybe, Adnan Yanazai. Still around. Still around. Only 24, 23, 24. You may remember him as a Man United prodigy that uh, David Moyes maybe put all his, pinned all his hopes on. Twice. But twice. <laughs> Didn't three, work out either three time. times? Three times? I think he took him to Sunderland as well. Yep. So United, Sunderland, oh. and Sociedad. So he's now... Oh, boys was Sociedad. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Three times not the charm. Nope. But yeah, so Yanazai made the squad. He still, to me, looks very selfish when he gets the ball. He just wants to have a run at people and show everybody the skills he's got. I, he's a bit of a punk, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I don't know if but I would go could, that far. But he could... Yeah. He's, he's such a punk and so confident in himself that he could light it up. There's that too. You know what I'm saying? I feel bad about calling him that now. I apologize, Adnan. I think part of that, well, no, the only reason why I object, I don't, I have, I don't care about Adnan Yanez one way or the other. I think the only reason why I object is because I think that's rooted in watching him shoot when they were already like 5 nil up. Mm-hmm. Uh, or w- they were destroying somebody 4-1, to one, I think it was. Uh, they're destroying Costa Rica. And he shot a lot in that game, and it felt a bit more like a young player trying to make sure everybody knew he should be on the roster. So it's like he's still a teenager trying to prove that he's got skills. When he's actually 23, you said, right? Yes. Yeah. He's still kind of young. He's still kind of young, but he's not 17, <laughs> but 18. But he knows better. He's a grown man. He should do. He's a grown man. He should do. Okay, a reason to support Belgium at the World Cup, especially if you're a U.S. fan. Any reason? Uh, it's not necessarily U.S. connected. It's just that they will be very fun to watch. That's, There's yeah. going to be opportunities at the back, but then they're going to have tons of sh- shots. They're probably going to score a decent number of goals. They mm-hmm. will be very fun to watch. And if you're a Premier League fan, they are very close to a Premier League all-star team. <laughs> yeah, if you're a Spurs fan, mm-hmm. a lot of Spurs in there, right? Yep. Uh, Vertonghen, Alderweireld, uh, Moussa yeah, Dembele. We'll see how long Alderweireld lasts. True, okay. Uh, former Spurs fan. <laughs> uh, if you're a Man United fan and you enjoy watching Lukaku score goals, this might be for you. Or Fellaini um, chest the ball. Yes, also that. He's for, in we there. forgot to mention Fellaini, right? He's he in could there. make an appearance. He is um, another useful player that could play sort of, sort of defensive midfield for them. Sure. Yeah? I, won't, I don't see Martinez resorting to stick Fellaini up front and let's aim long balls at him. We shall see, it's man. It's very un Roberto. We'll um, see what happens. That. But similar to what you said, I would say that if Paul Thomas Anderson were to direct a movie about this Belgian team, he would title it There Will Be Goals. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Both ends, right? I think you've got the best chance of watching some goals um, when you watch a Belgium game. And if Paul W.S. Anderson were to direct it, it would be Resident <laughs> Evil 17, There Will Be Shooting? I don't know. It would I don't be called know. Belgium versus Predators. Yes, there it is. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right, Belgium, consider yourself previewed. Yours um, is better. Should we move on? <laughs> Belgium versus Adidas Predators? Um, should um, we move no, on? too far. Oh, sorry. Should we move on to Panama? Let's do it. Let's preview Panama slightly with a heavy heart because Panama is the team that I look at I remember the US giving them an absolute whooping, 4-0. Mm-hmm. And yet, I mean, do you remember that game? I thought, we're done. US is going to the World Cup. Uh, Panama are over. Panama are at the World Cup. They are. Mm-hmm. <sighs> 4-0 loss. Uh, I would say maybe a little grain of salt with this, with this preview because I have tried very hard not to let that factor into my feelings about this yes. because I think any time there's a team there – and your team isn't, and you feel kind of personally connected to one and not the other, yes. it might bleed into it. I don't think it has. You know that what? said, I feel bad for even mentioning that at the top of the preview now, because there might be some Panamanian mm-hmm. listener listening who yeah. doesn't want to hear about that as we're about to preview Panama. So I my mean, apologies. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they wouldn't mind hearing that they've qualified for the first ever <laughs> World Cup at the expense of the United States. Fair enough. Yes. Fair enough. Yes. But with all that said, it has... I don't think it's bled into my, my preview, but oh. I will say that I am not... 
This is one of the few teams that I don't you have. complete a sentence? I, this is one of the few teams at this tournament that I don't have expectations for. I'll put okay. it that way. Yes, Even yes, Saudi yes. Arabia, I think there's a chance that they win a game, get some points, potentially could get out of the group. I just I, Saudi Arabia will score more goals, at least, because they kind of go for it, whereas yeah. Panama do not go mm-hmm. for it. I, I think, essentially, and we're going to get into a much deeper explanation, but I have a feeling that Panama are going to rely on certain tricks and tactical approaches and gamesmanship to get try to get results, and I just don't think they will be that interesting to watch outside of being deep underdogs. There we now go. Now, that said, they are a very experienced team. So their uh, real nickname, their genuine nickname is Los Canaleros, uh, the Canal Men. There's also La Marea Roja, the Red Tide. I've never heard that before. Ooh, that's, good, that's what it's listed as, so I went with it. But my nickname for them is The Vets. The vets. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. Six, pl- six players on this roster uh, have over 100 caps. 11 players have over 50 caps. Nine players are 30 or older. Uh, both of their all-time top six, scores. Six players are animal doctors. That's true. That's a big one. That's part of why I chose that one. Uh, I tried to find a way to differentiate them, but it just felt too weird. Uh, both of their all-time top scores, Tejada and Perez, and their all-time appearance leader, Gomez, are on this roster. Yeah. So it's a very experienced, uh, familiar-to-each-other team. The one po- really positive way to look at Panama mm-hmm thinking of the vets angle is there's a lot of players who've given long service Mm -hmm. to this national team absolutely right Tejada and Perez and Torres and Beloy and all these guys Pineda Pineda Pineda, the Mm -hmm. goalkeeper as far as I know they've never refused a call up they've gone and played in every game and often with no big reward right yeah Uh, whereas now they're all those guys towards the end of their international careers and towards the end of their careers in many cases right Perez is what 37 or so Mm. um they get this big reward of going to the World Cup together as mm-hmm. a group after playing together for so long. Oh, I mean, so there's the there's the sort of uplifting, positive version. Of yeah, this. And to, yeah, and to go, I mean, to go with like the last category first. I mean, that's the reason to root for this team is number one, they're a Concacaf team. They're here uh, because they did better than the United States. They were a better team than the United States in mm-hmm. qualifying. They deserve to Over be there. One hundred percent. Don't get me wrong. They deserve to be here. The United States does well, not. We could argue whether Blas Perez's goal crossed the line. But, yeah, but yeah. that goes back to the old like. Don't make them have to make a choice. You're right. <laughs> um, right. Um, but I, and so, like, yes, they absolutely deserve to be here. And it is a good thing that all of these gentlemen get an opportunity to play at the world's greatest competition before they all retire. I just wonder if maybe it would have been better if they did this four years uh, earlier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, legs-wise, mm-hmm. definitely. Okay, so the nickname is Los Canaleros, mm-hmm. as Taylor said. I think they should be called the Central American Sweden. That's generous. So if you remember our Sweden preview, Mm -hmm. it was about how Sweden were tight and compact and defensive and were just sort of willing to hit on the break. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Panama will do as well. I would agree with you. The one thing I would say, sorry to not yes and you here, but Sweden, we knew what they were. It's the the other improv is no but. Yeah, obviously. (laughs) Uh, But Sweden 442, right? Like 442, we could pick 10 of their 11 starters, if not 11 of their 11 starters. Yeah. Panama, I kind of don't know what they're going to do. I have a strong okay. idea of what they're going to do, but they have played one, two, three, four. Put it that way. They have played five different formations in the last couple months. I and mean, that's not true. In the last six months, I'd say, yeah, yeah. dating back to like the final World Cup qualifiers. Should we do, should we do the tactical history? Because I find this fascinating. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, but anyway, that's the only reason why I disagree with you about Sweden is only because Sweden, at least, we knew this is exactly what they're going to mm-hmm. do. This is exactly how they're going to play. Because they haven't play. changed tactics since the 1970s. There it is. There are questions about Panama. So here's what we did know about Panama mm-hmm. from watching them in the Hex and against the US and the Gold Cups and all that. They played either a 4-5-1 or yep. maybe a 4-4-2. Mm-hmm. It? And it looked, most of the time I've seen them, it's sort of a 4-1-4-1, yep. right? With, uh, is it Gomez? Gabriel Gomez. Gabriel Gomez as the central defensive midfielder. And they would choose, ahead of the four midfielders, they would just choose one striker. And it could yep. be Blas Perez, could be Tejada, could be Gabi Torres. Okay, that's what they've always done, 4-1-4-1. And it seemed to work. And I assume that's what they would do at the World Cup. They did some experiments in March mm-hmm. that kind of took me by surprise. So yep. back in March, um, Hernan Dario Gomez, I believe yep. the coach's name is, um, tried to, I'm going to say, copy Costa Rica. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Five four one that morphs into a 3-4-3 as we go forward. Yep. They lost 6-0 to Switzerland. They sure did. Yeah. Uh, but before the that, they lost 1-0 to Denmark. And I think they thought... I, I don't think that they're going to go back 5 in this tournament. I really don't. I've seen some previews say that they will, that it's something that uh, Hernan Dario Gomez seems very focused on being able to do. I think if the Switzerland game had gone better, they might. Better than but, 6-0. So you lose 1-0 to Denmark... 
Denmark are a decent team, obviously. They're going to the World Cup. They can be tricky. They've got tricky players. Maybe you just need to adjust. You pull some players around. That's basically what the team said after that loss was, oh, yeah, a little bit more like tactical instruction. If we figure some stuff out, this system might work. Then you play Switzerland and lose 6-0. And I have to believe that you don't walk away from two losses, seven goals against none four, and think, we're right there. We're so mm-hmm. close. So they may end up doing that. And if they do, yeah, it's back three. Then maybe 3-4-2-1, three, maybe 3-5-2, three, something like that. Who knows? But I still think you're probably going to see them more in that 4-5-1. Here's my guess. is Most of the previews that predict a 5-4-1, yep. 3-4-3 type scenario, wing backs and three mm-hmm. center backs basically, were written before Panama started playing their pre-World Cup friendlies. And we wa- we watched good chunks of the, the recent pre-World Cup friendlies. Yep. They've gone back to the old four they and have. back. Yeah? yeah, And I think it's the right choice based on what I saw of that Switzerland game. I, I, think, it, yeah. I think it's about Panama's central defenders who are... The senior defenders are very senior, mm-hmm. um, as in they're not very fast. So <laughs> Roman Torres, um, is it Felipe Beloy? Mm-hmm. Um, those, guys are, those guys are not fleet of foot. They don't have the legs to cover the ground in a back three. Um, also, Torres is so determined to go tackle people. Mm-hmm. Um, he kept leaving holes in the back three yep. by charging out, right? So that... That was always going to be a problem in the back three. I mean, I can get to my prediction if you'd like. Please, or we can, or should we stick with tactics for one more? No, I mean, yeah. I think we've basically got yeah. to that, right? You'll hear that they're going to be in a five four one. I predict mm-hmm. the four one four one is back and it's there to stay and it's there to just still frustrate as much as the five four one, but they'll be more effective in doing so. I would agree, yeah. uh, but I predict that Roman Torres. The aforementioned. See how Sanders uh, centre back. His age, lack of form, and fitness uh, will be obviously exploited for at least one goal. Uh, and I think for at least for no other reason than what you just mentioned, he likes to step. I think a lot of times uh, from the games I've seen them play against the United States, as well as games against other opposition and the friendlies. I think sometimes their back line gambles a bit. They're, it's not mm-hmm. necessarily about, like, let's keep a, a straight line. We're going to keep organized. We're going to be very disciplined. We're going to go high at this point. We're going to step back at this point. It feels sort of like, sure, you go. And it feels a little bit like Roman Torres stepping out to try to make a play that he might have been able to make five or six years ago, but he's lost a step or two or three. And so I think sometimes he steps, the defense, the rest of the defense doesn't, and it leaves that gap. You go back to the U.S. game, Christian Pulisic runs right through that gap because Roman yep. Torres has stepped. I've seen plenty of players do it. We saw like four different Swiss players do it in that uh, six nil loss. I think you're going to see him get very exploited against these higher quality opponents from Belgium and, the, and England, not the United States. I agree, but I feel bad saying it because Roman Torres seems like a good. Dude I love to Roman me. Torres. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think it's 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 the sad thing where like I don't want my affection for a player to color what the reality is going to be and I think if he's in a back three I don't think that suits his game at all Mm -hmm. I think we saw that as we've already talked about and the the reason I called them the Central American Sweden is if they do end up with a formation that is a very compact back four Mm -hmm. because you can't have a compact back five as part of the problem right that invites you to cross then I think that plays to Torres' strengths. If yep. it's just heading balls away, mm-hmm. Roman Torres and I think to a lesser extent Felipe Bedoy can do that all day. I would back Roman Torres to win most of those headers. Mm-hmm. But if he's tempted out into the open field, I think then he's in a bit of trouble. But we spent a lot of time just harping on Roman Torres, yeah. and I don't necessarily want that to be the case because, yeah. as I said, I like him. But also because it's not like this is just him. You mentioned Beloy. I think it's more likely if they do a four one four one that it's uh, Fidel Escobar partnering him. Mm. Escobar a bit more mobile, but he is a decade uh, younger. Yeah, yeah, he's twenty three years old for the New York Red Bulls, uh, and I think he does offer a little bit more ability to cover ground and cover some of those gaps. So maybe he helps uh, allow Torres to have a little bit more freedom. The little I've seen of them as mm-hmm. well. Um, Escobar is better with the ball than mm. Torres or Beloy or yep. any of the other centre backs. Mm-hmm. Machado maybe is the other one. Can I give you a final Roman Torres uh, nugget? Yeah. Uh, have you seen the footage of him at the press conference? Uh uh-uh. uh So there's because you know he's very solidly constructed. Let's put it that <laughs> sure. way, right? Uh-huh. So in a press conference, uh, someone <laughs> someone put it to him. Um, it's been said that you're the heaviest player at the World Cup. Roman Torres stands up, lifts his shirt up. And just points at a very finely chiseled six pack yep. of muscles. Uh, yeah, so what, the, what were they trying to say there? Like, they just shots fired? They're trying to say he's fat? Yes. By saying Torres he- isn't fat. By saying How heavy. Dare you? Well, he does look like, he, he, I don't know, he looks like he's got a belly that pokes through his jersey. I've always wondered, is this guy in shape or not? And he very much proved it is all muscle. Um, he's perfectly in good shape. How dare you, people? They would yeah. never ask Jared and Shakiri that question. <laughs> He, he looks just as solidly built. Yeah. That's all it is. Well, fair enough. What kind of, what kind of journalism are we doing here? I don't know. Hey, uh, hey uh, you're fat, right? Like, <laughs> what? 
No. The answer was no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The was no. So, but if you see him looking slow, it's just because he's old and injured, not because yeah. he's fat. Exactly. That's way better. <laughs> That's a Roman Torres preview. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Machado. I think uh, there's a chance that he's one of the back three if they go with the back three. If they don't, I think there's a chance that he starts at right back. Yeah. Uh, it could be him or Michael Murillo. Michael Murillo, much faster, much better yep. getting forward. Another Red Bulls player. I really, I've come to really like Mikey Murillo, mm-hmm. the right back slash wing back. Yep. Not a fan of Mikey Murillo, the center back. So, yeah. Yeah. But I've come around on Murillo. All right. Yeah. But then do you like, do you think that they like the paciness of Murillo or do you think they like the uh, defensive solidarity and throwing ability of Machado? <laughs> I think they like the throwiness of Machado. Yep. So do you think that means he could start or he will start? Yeah. I mean, I mm-hmm. think there's a good chance he starts because he has the big lung Yep. Throw. And this is the second time we've talked about long throws at the World Cup. Who's the other player we talked about? I was oh, hoping I you can remember because I can't. I can't. It's a few previews back. Yep. There's another player at this World Cup um, who can really fire that ball in there. Right? Somebody from Iceland. Gunnarsson? Yes, Gunnarsson. It's Gunnarsson, the central midfielder for Iceland, yeah. So the, there, could be a, right. there could be a throwdown somewhere between hey. Gunnarsson and Machado. You never know. He will launch that ball in there. And then if you've got Blas Perez... Or, um, I've forgotten his first name, but Tahada, either of those centre forwards, very capable of challenging for balls in the air. They may even push the centre backs forward and try and take advantage of Machado's big, long, flat throw into the box. Mm-hmm. And just a reminder that this thing is definitely dangerous. When the US went away to Panama, mm-hmm. they conceded a goal from a Machado long throw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it's definitely an area of opportunity for Panama. The thing that actually you just kind of alluded to there uh, when you were listing attackers, it's one thing I haven't really been able to understand, and it makes me it does make me wonder if uh, Hernan Dario Gomez is going to do something slightly different. The number of forwards they brought for a team that is only going to play likely one forward, yep. it's very confusing to me because you've got Blas Perez, You've got Gabi Torres, as you mentioned. You've got Luis Tejada. Uh, then there's also Abdiel Arroyo, who's a center forward, mm-hmm. can play on the right wing. And you've got left winger uh, Ismael Diaz, who can also play as a center forward. So, yeah, Arroyo and Diaz, mm-hmm. I think they're there because they can play on the wing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, the weird thing to me is, yeah, for one the one spot then, because those guys can also play forward. It is weird that they brought Torres, Tejada, and Perez. Yeah. I think that goes back to the thing we said at the top of the show, that these are the vets. These are the guys that have given their lives that to, is a good given point. their professional lives to Panama mm-hmm. for the last decade or more. They deserve a trip to the World Cup. And you couldn't say, hey, sorry, Tejada, we're taking Perez as the target man, yep. or vice versa, right? Mm-hmm. You, have to, you have to take both of them. It's better for the squad if you take both of them. All right. All right. Okay. That makes more sense. There which, we go. Which leads to my first... We're figuring some stuff out here. Which leads to my first prediction. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, bit of, oh, so a bit of, bit of a context here for people who are not familiar with Panama. Mm-hmm. Perez, Tejada, not very fast, good in the air. Yep. Right? Gabby Torres, very, 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 very fast. Torres is a pacey, pacey outlet up top, and it's a weird choice they're going to have to make between like, the pace of Torres or the smarts of Perez and Tejada. The big thing that comes with Blas Perez is a reputation. If you followed CONCACAF soccer, he is famous for fouling people, winning free kicks, which he's very good at, arguing with people. He is just a constant menace and a nuisance and very annoying but effective is mm-hmm. Blas Perez, yep. right? So my prediction is, this is based on mm-hmm. a lot of watching of Blas Perez. You're wincing as if I'm going to steal one of your predictions here. Uh, it's probably going to be so. Uh, I just like that you're doing all of the... Like caveats and disclaimers first, so I don't have to do them myself. <laughs> just from watching him a lot and seeing him, it's not just stereotypes, but... Okay, Blas Perez uh-huh. will foul a defender hard, then immediately look at the ref and extend both his arms to the full wingspan to protest. <laughs> yep. That is the classic Blas Perez move. Yep. And then maybe sit down and act like he's been hurt too. Yep. That happens sometimes as well. Uh-huh. Yeah, and again... Now, I'll do the disclaimer myself to say this is not just us. We try to avoid the stereotypes. If one player scored a header six years ago that was very famous, we're not going to be like, oh, man, he scores so many great headers. Mm -hmm. But But in this case— If he did it every week. And if he just (laughs) recently did something semi-shady against Kasper Schmeichel in that Denmark friendly— He got sent off for basically kicking Kasper Schmeichel in mid-air. Yep, and then feigning injury. Uh, So I have that Blas Perez— Included, uh, I have that at least three English players will be booked against Panama, <laughs> mm-hmm. or Panama will get them booked. Is so a the entire way to do. back three? It's possible. Yeah. Yes, because you've I got. I'm fascinated by how much England will, wa- whether or not England will watch footage of Blas Perez and try and be ready for him. But it's not just Blas Perez, because I think you have Deli Ali, who we know can have a bit of a temper, can mm-hmm. get a little bit emotional and react to challenges. I think it is going to be part of Panama's game, and. 
strangely, I don't mean this as a criticism because it's what you have to do. I, I haven't looked. I'm going to assume that they are up there with maybe Saudi Arabia as the biggest underdog at this World Cup. Uh, and so you've kind of got to do what you can do. For some teams, it's, you know, like just pack it in and hope for the best. And for other teams, it's a little bit of gamesmanship. And I think you're going to see mm-hmm. some of that from Panama against England. And I think it'll be important if Perez, if he starts, mm-hmm. can win free kicks. Yep. Basically, his job will be win a free kick, like 30, 20, 40, whatever yards mm-hmm. from goal, win a free kick. Because we're not going to... You're not going to hold the ball up and seven players are going to come and join you in a big wave of an attack, right? Mm-hmm. That's not going to happen. There are no waves in the canal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more going to be win a free kick, then we'll get bodies in the box, then we'll serve it in, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's more the game plan, I think, yep. with Blas Perez and Panama. And there's, I want to say there's no shame in that, right? If that's your best shot... That's how Panama have done it. That's how Panama have become a competitive nation recently. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what they're going to do. I think if you can win a game when you weren't expected to win or, like, I don't know, completely shock the world and get out of the group, then you will take whatever it takes to make that happen. I've just thought of something. Hmm. There will be VAR at the World Cup. That's interesting. VAR is not a friend to Blas Perez. No, it's not. No, it is not. That's a very good point, Daryl. I had not thought about that. Mm. So it would be interesting to see. Maybe we'll just say that they get var a lot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Bus pair specifically. It'd be CONCACAF versus VAR. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but I did want to add, because we've talked a lot about uh, sort of the maybe negative tactics, we should talk a little bit about some of their stronger players. Yeah, because we do. haven't even mentioned uh, Anibal Godoy, yes. Armando Cooper, who if you're going with a four one four one, we expect to start as yes. your two more attacking number eight sort of uh, central mm, midfielders. More attacking compared to... Gomez, who will just stay at home. Yeah, that's the one. But not actually attacking. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your triangle in midfield, basically, right? Yeah. Gomez, Godoy, and Cooper. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Um, and then the other sort of rock that I think is worth mentioning is Jaime Pinedo. Uh, we Goal talked keeper? about him earlier. Yep. Mm-hmm. Currently, of uh, Dinamo Bucharest, former LA Galaxy goalkeeper. Right, yeah, you didn't see that coming. 36 Dinamo years Bucharest. old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the thing that I thought was pretty interesting about him, uh, most of this informed by his performances in CONCACAF, uh, in CONCACAF qualifying, he is very good at coming off of his line in 1v1 situations or oh. in potential 1v1 situations, uh, especially in that 4 0 loss. Like, Yes, they conceded four goals, one of which was a penalty. But, the U.S.? Yes, but several times, uh, I think Josie Altador had two, Bobby Wood, I think, had one, Christian Pulisic had one, where they were not necessarily in on goal, but had this opportunity where suddenly they were wide open at the top of the box, they took a touch, and Pineda was there. Mm-hmm. I think he's very good about recognizing, this is the threat right now, this person is going to shoot, I'm coming out and smothering that oh, one. Oh, so not like a Manuel Neuer out with his feet, but uh, no, come, come out and exactly. meet you in the box and smother the ball before you shoot. When You know when you see the goalkeeper like slide out and they sort of block it with their chest and yes. then and like kind of hoover up the ball and also maybe the attacker's legs at the same time. Yeah, yeah. That sort of sequence. I think he's very good at sort of recognizing like, ooh, Torres might not get to that one, so I'm going to step out and slide in and make sure I collect that one cleanly. I imagine that's a th- <laughs> that specific sentence goes through his mind quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Um, we should also mention um, Alberto Quintero mm-hmm. was maybe their most dangerous winger. He got injured. He did. What, just a few days ago? Mm-hmm. There was a a weirdly uh, heartwarming but heartbreaking photo of him on a hotel bed with his leg all wrapped up and all the team around him supporting him. Oof. But he has been obviously dropped from the squad mm-hmm. uh, because because he can't go. So their biggest threat from the wing, I would argue, is... I forgot how to pronounce his name. Jose Luis Rodriguez? No. Oh, Ed- Edgar Barcenas. Edgar mm-hmm. Barcenas, mm-hmm. Uh, who will probably play on the right wing for Panama, yep. is my guess. Uh, I think he'll win number eight. Uh, pretty low center of gravity, dribbly, run at you, Cross the ball in for Blas Perez. Yep. <laughs> That's Edgar Barcenas. Not a bad player at all. I think he plays in the Mexican second division. Uh, the Asensio. Yes, yeah? I believe you are correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was pretty confident in that. So yeah. he would not be allowed on Roberto Martinez's team. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> he would not. I have a second prediction for hmm. you. Panama will concede a goal after a defensive miskick. Yep. After watching a lot of Panama over the years and a lot of Panama in the last few months, you know, highlights in the build up to get ready for this, so many times I see a clearance that is sliced or accidentally kicked in the air or a pass out of the. I'm going to classify a defensive miskick as also an attempted pass out of the back that goes awry. Yep. Of too many mistakes in a way that will get harshly punished by Belgium or maybe even England or maybe even Tunisia. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, it doesn't give me any joy to say that, but I really do see that happening. No, I'm with you. And yeah. that's why, like, 
I I'm with you on both accounts that I think it will happen, and it also like it does not give me joy because there are specific incidents which, full disclosure, you and I watched and kind of laughed at because we were like that wasn't good at all. Mm-hmm. But it's not worth going into that because I don't want to just end up like listing all of these reasons about Panama because again I still think it's great that they're there. I I'm excited to see what they try to do in this tournament. Yep. but I don't want to present this false narrative for the sake of being positive and yeah. everybody no, can win. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. One, one more guy I want to mention again mm-hmm. is if you don't see Perez or Tejada start, then you're going to see Gabby Torres start up top. Yep. And this guy is rapido, right? So if you, you will see Panama hit some balls for him to chase after or just dribble at you at pace, Gabby Torres is genuinely a threat. Mm-hmm. He's not some world-class player because it, it looks a little rougher when he's running with the ball than, than when, say, you know... A, a top La Liga player mm-hmm. does it but Gabby Torres is dangerous running at you yep alright uh, in terms of young players to watch or players who could get a move um, I think we've already said this several times but one more time repeating it this is the sort of not I hesitate to say golden generation because that's one of those words on the World Cup bingo that I don't want to use or <laughs> phrases um, but I will say that you it's the, do, it's the olden generation yeah there we go uh, I've already said all the numbers about how like experienced this team is but then you do have the kind of younger generation who are the ones who I think are coming through so players like we mentioned already uh, Mario Escobar uh, I said his name briefly Jose Luis Rodriguez who he's, plays for Gent's second division team yep. I believe or second team yep. he's a uh, 19 year old winger who we think will probably start on the left now maybe that he Quintero is injured. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think he maybe wouldn't have if Quintero were healthy, uh, but I think he might step in. And so you've got these kind of young players who maybe are the ones that we're going to become more familiar with in future World Cup qualifying cycles. That's true. It is the next generation, mm-hmm. right? Panama, the next generation. Yep. Ismail Diaz is the guy I wrote down. That's the other one. Thank He's you. He's a left winger who now has more chance at starting after Quintero's injury. He plays for Deportivo La Coruña's mm-hmm. reserve team. That's so it's right. a lot of um, young wingers on European reserve teams, right? Yes. Deportivos and Gents reserve teams. Mm-hmm. Worth keeping an eye on. Um, oh, I didn't give my um, physical description. Mm. Hernan Dario Gomez mm-hmm. looks like Ziggy Schmidt's Colombian cousin. <laughs> Fair? Yes. Yeah? Yes, with the worst haircut, maybe? Isn't that yeah, saying something? Def- yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, but... He's an experienced uh, gentleman. Uh, he's taken three different countries now with Panama to the World Cup. He's also taken Colombia and Ecuador. It's not his first rodeo. It is not, not. his first rodeo. Mm-hmm. Okay, how about a reason to support Panama at the World Cup? I mean, they're where the United States would have been if the United States had qualified. That's where the U.S. probably would have gotten drawn. I don't think that's true because I think the FIFA rankings mean the U.S. would have been in a different pot to Panama. Well, I'm choosing to believe that the United States would be there. <laughs> so you want Panama to do, uh, you know, to represent CONCACAF, to beat England, to continue that tradition of humiliating England <laughs> at a World Cup. You could support Panama because you're an MLS fan, right? Yep. You've got Red Bulls, you've got San Jose Earthquakes, you've got Seattle Sounders, you've got Houston Dynamo. I mean, Jaime uh, Pinedo, I believe, is still beloved by Galaxy fans. I, I'm not sure, but okay. Um, he is still liked by Galaxy fans? <laughs> I, I genuinely don't know. So there's a lot of MLS mm. representation there. Yep. There's also the fact that, I mean, as you've probably definitely picked up from us talking about them, they are huge underdogs at this tournament. Yep. They might be the biggest underdog at this tournament, more so than Iceland. Yep. When you look at where Iceland players play and where Panama's players play, this is the underdog. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Every point is a victory. Every clean sheet is a victory for Panama at this World Cup. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Consider yourself preview, Panama, <laughs> unless you have anything else to add. I do not. I do have to add that we have two more teams to get to. But first, we've got to get to today's sponsor, SeatGeek, Seat our Geek. friends and yours. Our uh, long-term sponsors. We mm-hmm. really love SeatGeek. They have made a commitment to the Total Soccer Show, and we heart them for it. And we've committed back. <laughs> long-term committed relationship. Buying tickets can be complicated and confusing, but there's a better way to buy with SeatGeek. It's the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to every type of live event. Uh, I have said before, I'll say it again, I do enjoy that Dance they have the, the record spins. Uh, that's obviously number one. Number two is that they've got the different color-coded system. Yes. So I always get that anxiety about like, should I be paying this much for a ticket? And I appreciate that they say, yes, you should. Or no, you should not. With green lights or red lights. And orange lights in there too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So maybe you should, depends uh, how you feel about this. Yeah, yeah. true, true, true. <laughs> so what we like to do is get Taylor on the SeatGeek app, let him have a, sh- a scroll through, mm-hmm. see what event he would like to go to. Yep. Taylor, oh, you haven't told me, so I'm very excited. What have you found on SeatGeek this week? I have found that Bill Burr is returning to <laughs> Richmond at the Altria <laughs> Theatre. Uh, we saw him last time he was here. It, yes. was, it was interesting to me, I have to say this. Have you seen the Netflix special that came about from that 
performance. No, oh, so he was working on he was workshopping yeah. stuff, and then he did a Netflix special. Yeah. No, I have not seen his Netflix. It special. was it was very similar, which was interesting because it's a much more like almost experimental Bill Burr, I would say. Mm. Uh, but it was interesting to see how he sort of had modified jokes from when we saw him. Uh, so I would like to see him again for that reason uh, because I love new, some Bill Burr. Is he working on a new? Album? I'm assuming he 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 does the thing where he uh, works on a, uh, a set. Does the big special, throws it all out, and starts again. So yes, I think he's working on a new stand-up special. I would prefer to see him more towards the end of his run. Yeah, you don't want. You don't, I guess you don't want to be the, uh, the want, first go. I want the almost final version of the Bill Burr hour. But I think I think I like <laughs> Bill Burr because uh, aside from him being very funny, yeah. uh, I like that he doesn't hide that he's working on stuff. Not mm-hmm. to say that like, well, that joke didn't work. But I think two different times. He said, like, I haven't figured you guys out yet. Like, he really is trying to figure out yeah. what the crowd responds to and doesn't right. respond to. Here's my take on uh-huh. a scene, Bill Burr. Yep. I, thought, I think he thought Richmond, Virginia was yep. more Southern than it was, mm-hmm. right? And I think he pitched it in a less hip- – like, Richmond's kind of a hipstery town yep. at this point, and I think he pitched it less hipstery. I agree. And then he couldn't work it out when what he th- – he didn't get the expected reaction to mm-hmm. certain things. For that reason, I kind of enjoyed it. I feel like we paid $20 too much for those tickets. All right. Well, we'll see if maybe there's a way that we could not do that next time. I know of a way. How, what's that way, Daryl? So with the SeatGeek uh, app, if you... It's, I mean, like, like, it took me a minute because for a second I was like, I don't know if you should... Oh, I see what you did. <laughs> if you enter... <laughs> You download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code TSS in the settings. Yep. You will get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Mm-hmm. You'll get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Download the app. Download the app. It's the most important part, and it's free. Click the settings tab. Enter promo code TSS for Total Soccer Show. Guaranteed $20 off your first purchase no matter how far through his tour Bill Burr is. Mm-hmm. And I did want to add, if you're not living in Richmond or if you're not a Bill Burr fan, uh, I did look at some other, other comedians and cities are available. Including Dave Chappelle and Jon Stewart, who are touring together. together? They're doing like hmm. eight shows in Boston and six shows in Texas. So if you live in Boston or the Boston area or Texas... They got you covered. That's a combo. I'd see that combo. I would definitely see that yeah. combo. I think they're doing two dates in Canada, too. So Canada, we haven't forgotten you either. But either way, thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring today's episode of the Total Soccer Show. Now more World Cup previews. There sure are. We're saving England for the grand finale, mm-hmm. but also because they were drawn fourth into the group. Also that. Um, <laughs> the penultimate team mm-hmm. in the penultimate group is Tunisia. Hello, Tunisia. Um, Tunisia is a team that I was not very familiar with before we did these previews. Mm-hmm. Nor and, was I. And I'm not ashamed of that because I think there's no reason I would have watched Tunisia over, nope. over I mean, the there, years. there are reasons why you wouldn't be familiar with this group of players. Why is that? So it's essentially uh, from the Reddit preview, I believe. The person who wrote that one did a very good job. Um, but Shout it, out to Reddit. Some of those yeah. previews have been very, very good. True. Uh, but it, it essentially, the argument was that the Tunisian league has gotten uh, more money flowing into it, which means more players are staying there because they can make more. On top of that, the stigma about going to play for other uh, – uh, predominantly Arabic team or Arab teams. Yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of players based in Saudi Arabia. Exactly, because there is a lot of money there. I think one of the maybe the crown prince or one of the princes in Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. has injected a lot of money into that league. So there's just more money. Also, also on Egypt, offering. right? Mm-hmm. I see yep. a lot of Al Ahly, and I don't know if it's Saudi Arabia or, yeah. or in Egypt. Uh, it, I think sometimes it's both. Yeah. I think there's some from one and some from the other. Uh, Al Riyadh also represented. Yeah. Um, but I think so. You have the money in Tunisia, in other Arab leagues, and then Saudi Arabia especially. So there's more players going that route, which is not a route that you and I are familiar with. So yeah. it's not as though a lot of these players are playing in France and Belgium and the Netherlands and England. Some certainly some are, are yeah. but there's, not... Yeah, there's some league earned representation. Here. Yeah, but, but not, not enough that we would expect. be like, oh yeah, that guy and that guy and that guy, the yeah, way yeah. you might with, say, Morocco. And it's not like a France B team, like some people might have imagined, yeah. as yeah. in like French-born players with Tunisian heritage who right. couldn't make the France team. It's not that. It's a lot of Tunisian-Tunisian players. There's a couple of those. There's a couple yes. of those, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, their nickname mm-hmm. is... One of the best nicknames at the World Cup. Yep, the Eagles of Carthage. Mm-hmm. It just sounds so I don't know um, epic. Yep, the Eagles of Carthage. Are you f- how familiar are you with Carthage? Zero. There familiar. we go. All right, so. Slight history lesson to get to my nickname. Uh, Carthage was historically uh, Rome's biggest rival, the Roman Empire, their biggest rival. In Uh, in football? uh, No, not so much. Uh, But uh, they did not like each other. They fought several different wars, uh, including three Punic Wars. The third one was the one where where the Romans destroyed all of Carthage, sowed salt, made sure that nothing was ever going to be there again. What's Punic? 
A Punic War, it's the, it's the name of, I believe, the Carthaginian general who started it. I forget okay. how it was, but that's what it comes from. But anyway, uh, my nickname is Hasdrubal's Revenge. Excuse me, what? Hasdrubal. Uh, re- his revenge. Uh, Hasdrubal was the leader of the Carthaginians during the Third Punic War. That was the siege of Carthage and the complete destruction of their empire. Um, but he led a well-trained force that couldn't defend <laughs> against stronger European opposition who besieged their territory for long stretches of time. You tell me that's not this current Tunisian team. <laughs> that's good. That's really good. And they've got farther in this World Cup than the team from Rome. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> It all comes full circle. So talk to me about uh, Tunisia's defending then, since that, that's what you've landed on. Sure. I mean, it's it's. I think it's fair to say that this is another team similar to Morocco, where I think a lot of the narrative is going to be on, oh, they're just going to bunker, they're just going to ca- try to counterattack and frustrate. And similar to Morocco, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. I think that's true. I think Morocco will be more aggressive in mm-hmm. terms of pressing than Tunisia. I mean, Morocco will come after yep. you, right? Mm-hmm. Tunisia, I don't have them coming after you quite so much. But I also don't have them like Panama or Sweden style sitting deep, deep, yeah. deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah? I would agree with you. I think they might... Me- medium block yes. is what I'm going to say. And I think it would be more aggressive. It's just that they have a lot of roster concerns is the way I'm going to put it. Mostly injuries. Uh, the biggest one being uh, Youssef uh, M. Sakani or mm-hmm. M. Sakni. I Again, I apologize. But uh, he was their top scorer in qualifying, but he tore his ACL in April. He was absolutely going to be the one that they look to to score the goals to cause he problems. He would have been the center forward. He yeah. will be. Uh, yeah, Taha Yassin is another center forward. He is out with injury. Hamdi uh, Harbai uh, is a 33-year-old striker for Zolta Varagem in the Belgian second division. Scored 19 goals in 15 games. Not included in this one. All right. And so if, might- if you listen so far, uh, it's, it's fine to forget all of those names because yes. they won't be there. They will not be. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he criticized the FA. He referred to them as a mafia or the mafia. Uh, yes, he was saying basically that they, the FA was exerting too much control on the manager. And he has not been called up for this World Cup. Oh, so it's three different like very prominent goal scorers or potential prominent goal scorers not included in this team. And so I think as a result, they will look to be slightly more defensive. Interesting. Here's what they are doing to replace the missing mm-hmm. goal scorer. They're playing a winger at centre forward. Um, yep. His name is... Wabi Kazri. That's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Wabi Kazri um, is technically a Sunderland winger. Um, but this past season, in August, he went on loan to Rennes mm-hmm. in France, where they had a striker shortage, and they put Kazri up front. Mm-hmm. And he did quite well. I think he scored roughly one in three. I don't have the exact stats. But he plays centre forward like a winger. As in, he dribbles at you, he goes past you, then he shoots. Mm-hmm. He also has a nice shot from distance, does yep. Wabi Kazri. Here's my first prediction. He'll probably take their set pieces and has scored from a corner. So you've got, always got the Olympico possibility he as well. for Sunderland from a corner. There I we go. I believe against West Ham. And he said the reason that he left Sunderland to go on loan to Rennes recently is not because he thought he was too good to play in the championship, but because David Moyes was not playing him mm-hmm. So yep. there we go. Um, so he's the opposite of Adnan Yanazai. Um, here's my prediction. Mm-hmm. Um, Wabi Kazri will score from a direct free kick with a short run-up. Okay. So I've been watching some Kaz- style. been watching some Kazri free kicks. He's maybe one step at most. And then when you only take one step, you're not blasting it, you're bending it. He curls this ball up and into the usually the top right corner. He's so, bending it like Jess Mender? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's been a while since I saw that movie. But yeah. Uh Wabi Kazri with a direct free kick with a short run up that he will bend around the wall and into the top corner. I think that's a solid shout. I would add the one uh, negative that I, I heard about kind of routinely from uh, Wabi Khazri is that he has a short f- short fuse. Uh, he did score against... <laughs> a fuse as long as his run-up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, scored against Costa Rica in Iran, but also against Costa Rica. He got wound up by Kendall Waston, who... I mean, who hasn't been wound up by Kendall Waston? <laughs> but if you take that as an example, and maybe if you're Panama, you think... Oh, their primary goal scorer oh, can get a little bit annoyed. And if he gets a little bit annoyed, maybe he's not so focused on scoring against us. So maybe here's a boot to the shin. <laughs> How about general shape? Mm-hmm. The general shape of Tunisia. I see them technically in a 4-3-3. Four, 4-5-1. Three, three. But yeah, <laughs> the wingers drop deep and it becomes uh, a 4-5-1. Yep. The wingers will be a um, couple of talented guys, I think. Um, Anis Badri, um, I don't know if he's right or left. I think I've seen them I on I believe both. he'll be on the left with uh, Naeem Sliti on the right, okay. but I believe that's inverted. Oh, like mm-hmm. wrong foot. Okay, yeah. and so they interior dribble when they yes. get the mm-hmm. ball. Um, and the thing I see as well is 
whenever you, you are attacking Tunisia, they will show you inside. So yep. if you're coming at Slitty, he doesn't show you outside. The fullback won't show you outside. They will show you back towards the middle. So they funnel the ball. If you've got the ball, they funnel you back towards the middle where they have three central midfielders. Mm-hmm. And this is the interesting part to me. They don't really try to tackle you. Mm-mm. They just try to block off passing lanes, yep. right? They just stand to block the where, block where you want to go. And then they try and force you into making a bad pass when you try to force the ball. And then they get the ball back. And then they try to pass, 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 mm-hmm. which is why my nickname, I realized I didn't give my nickname, my nickname for Tunisia is the principled passers. Ooh, I like it. This team has a philosophy when they have the ball. We are going to pass this short amongst ourselves, even when it's definitely the wrong choice, mm-hmm. right? Even yeah. when they should be clearing it, kicking it long, even when they should be banging it into the channels for someone to chase, they will cluster close together and just almost keep doing rondos you know keep aways keep pass 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 the ball which leads to my prediction Tunisia will concede a goal after a 10 pass move of their own so they'll have a 10 pass move that breaks down with one pass too many and then they'll get hit on the counter Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's tragic, uh, but possible. Uh, and <laughs> well, I think kind of beautiful. But I think I, I, I love a commitment to a to a principle, even at great expense to yourself. And yeah, I, mean, I think there can be a line, uh, but I like that your description there because I think that is a good example of what I mean when I say that I think some people might look at them and think like, oh, they're going to bunker and be really defensive. Yes, you're going to see them at times where it is four and then five and then a huge gap, and then one. Mm -hmm. But it's because they're setting up to block off those options. So it's not just, okay, you can cross it in and we'll head it clear. And it's not just, okay, you can shoot from distance or we'll try to block it off. It's that we're trying to win the ball back by intercepting it near midfield. We want to win it further up so then we can come at you. And it's not us just hoofing it long to the one guy and hoping something happens. It's against their principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pass, 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 pass. pass. That's what's on the chalkboard in the Mm -hmm. dressing room. So again, that was (laughs) Anis Badri and Naeem Sliti. We think we'll be dropping in. Yep. uh, uh, to accompany Farjan Sasi, uh, Mohammed Amin Ben Amor, and then Elisiz uh, Shkiri. Yes. S K H I R I. Uh, I think w- we'll wear number 17. Every time I've seen him play, he wears number 17. You will see him at the base of midfield. Indeed. He is the chief pass, 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 passer. Mm hmm. Chief Fat Fat Fatter? Yeah. Is that his official title? Yes. All right, well, here's some other things that I noticed about Tunisia. Please do. Um, one. I think Tunisia, I'm predicting, will have at least two shots against England that will make the rest of their team annoyed. Um, and in the, Sp- in the Spain friendly, what I kept. I just say I love your predictions. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've, I've predicted the annoyed one like twice now, but I'm okay with it because it kept happening. Um, against Spain, there was so much strange decision making when they would shoot in the wrong moments, Tunisia. And you would see them do exactly what we just talked about. They'd be at midfield, they would intercept the ball, there'd be that six-pass sequence, and they would get to a spot where like, the attacker would have the ball, he'd have two players on either side, it was against two defenders, and he would shoot from 25 yards and it would go over. And you'd see the two players just do the stand-up and like, you know, make the Y shape, is what I'm going to say. <laughs> and I saw that routinely. They do 25% that... of YMCA. Yes. And I think <laughs> what that comes down to is nerves and the occasion. You're playing Spain, they're this massive team, you know what they represent, mm-hmm. you want to beat them. Here you are, oh my God, Gosh, I've got the shooting opportunity against Spain. I never thought I'd have it. I'm going to shoot it over. And I just wonder if Worth that... Worth noting, they really held Spain out for a long time in yep. that recent friendly. They mm-hmm. only lost 1-0 and not until the 80-something minute, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a, a warning to exactly. teams like England. And maybe it could have been 1-1 one one or 2-1 to one in favor of Tunisia. Mm-hmm. But again, I think just in those moments, they thought... I want to have the glory. I want to get the shot off. And it wasn't just one player doing it. It was a lot of players taking inopportune shots at inopportune moments. <laughs> and it just makes you wonder, at a World Cup, against Belgium, against England, even against Panama, when they're like, oh, we could score. We could do something here. You might just see players shooting when they probably shouldn't. So I'm going to say you're going to see two shots against England that make the rest of the players annoyed. Love it. Mm-hmm. Okay. But yo, another yes. England prediction for Hello. you here is that I think Tunisia's attacking press will catch England sleeping at least one time. Attacking press will catch yes. England sleeping. Uh, in both the Spain and Iran friendlies, uh, there were moments when those teams would loosen up a little bit and they weren't so careful with their passing and Tunisia seemed to know exactly when that came and they pounced and there was a turnover and it led to decent 
shooting chances. Now, again, oh. some of those chances were maybe taken at the wrong time, <laughs> but it's, I think a big part of it is Wabi Khazri, who we've been talking about, yeah. likes to step and likes to go at players. And so if they yeah, can... he's a winger playing center forward. It's so weird. It, this is actually, yeah. a while ago, you talked about someone being like Crystal Palace mm-hmm. because of Benteke being at front as a target man. This is more like actual Crystal Palace where they play wingers as center forwards. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, Wilfred Zahar and uh, Anthony Townsend as center forwards. But I think at least one Andros time... Townsend, excuse me. I know what you meant. Uh, at least one time, I think you'll see... England maybe just sort of like casually pass the ball between the back three mm-hmm. and Jordan Henderson or Eric Dyer or maybe they'll play a ball out wide it'll, that just doesn't quite get there it'll, it'll be, be Jordan Stones. Henderson <laughs> it'll be John Stones giving it away I see um, and then I think you may see that pass intercepted or Tunisia capitalize upon it and get a very good opportunity off of an England mistake that makes sense mm-hmm. I hope it doesn't happen but it, <laughs> but it makes sense all right here's the thing that it's not a prediction because mm-hmm. it's something that will definitely definitely happen number 13 Fejani Sassi. Mm-hmm. He's one of the central midfielders. I'm pretty confident he will start. You are going to see his tongue. Really? This guy, I spotted this once and then went to find it multiple times. Mm-hmm. Every time he has the ball and he's about to do something creative, he sticks his tongue out. Ooh. So he sticks his tongue out when he's dribbling. Not great at poker. He sticks his tongue out when he's about to make a pass. And it made me think of, the reason I said creative, you know some people when they say paint or write, they stick their tongue out. Just it's just like their their stance when they mm-hmm. do something creative. For Johnny Sassy does that, and I find it so endearing <laughs> that he's a professional soccer player who's going to the World Cup, and he's going to stick his tongue out while he's dribbling and passing. All right, one of the things that I think I love the most about when we do the previews is it gives we try to give people specific things to watch for and yeah. usually that's like tactical they're going to do this or they're going to like like approach it this way or they're going to make sure this guy's always involved in this way this is the type of thing i love though <laughs> is that it, when we get to the reasons to watch it is a reason to watch i want yep. to see a super slow motion replay in which for johnny sassy sticks that tongue out as he goes to do a double step yes, over that's that what i want great. i'm gonna be that looking for it now mm-hmm. yeah so look out for number 13 for johnny sassy's good tongue. job daryl i like that one quite a bit <laughs> you got anything else for me yeah um well should we talk about players who could get a move or players maybe who will rise to prominence or do you want to talk other things first first i would just like to describe the coach for you sure so the tunisian coach his name is nabil malul Mm -hmm. he looks like ricky gervais before he went to hollywood interesting interesting why do you say that because ricky gervais after he came to hollywood Uh uh-huh Got his hair kind of fixed, yep. lost a lot of weight, got in shape. Uh, I think Nabil Malou looks like if Ricky Gervais, maybe he looks like Ricky Gervais if he'd never been famous. Gotcha. <laughs> there's a reason, Fair? again, I, I alluded to something coming later on. Again, there's a reason why I froze momentarily when you said Ricky Gervais. More on that later. Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> I like that one. Uh, do, we should talk about Nabil uh, Malou for a second. Yes, let's do. Um, That's all I have on him, by the way. So I'm hoping you have better research. I can than tell I you that this is his second time in charge of Tunisia. I did not know that. Uh, he was in their last World Cup qualifying campaign they lost to Cape Verde in the third qualifying round which Ouch. means they didn't even make it to the group stage uh, he was let go after that but he does have the long uh, managerial career he took over Tunisia they again they him after that because they were really struggling in qualifying or they didn't at least believe in their manager uh, Henry uh, Kaspersak Kasper check? I don't know. Yeah, now uh, now yeah he's gone anyway. Two matches into their World Cup qualifying campaign. He's out. In came uh, Nabil Malul here there at the World Cup. So I think he has done a good job to navigate. It was a relatively e- one of the relatively easier uh, World Cup qualifying groups from Africa, but it's still there dealing with— There is no such thing because there's always a playoff at the end. This is true. Yeah. No? No, Not this time? No. Oh, okay. So I was just remembering uh, <laughs> yeah. the Bob Bradley guy. I was paused for a moment. No, I think they, they changed the format around. So now it's just <sighs> you play— Groups of four, you play everybody home and away, well, top team goes. Well, don't I look silly? A little bit, but frequently, yes. <laughs> but, I mean, he, again, he's got those injuries we talked about. There's injuries coming into the, uh, with this team, like nursing right now. Uh, Ali Malul, who will probably be the left-back starter, he's uh, carrying an injury. No, no relation. <laughs> I checked that one. Uh, Gailin Chalali uh, from Esperance, he is carrying an injury, as is Faradin Ben Youssef, who's another attacker. So, really, it's a lot of players who aren't there due to injury and a lot of players who might not be able to play because of injury. So, given all of those obstacles, I think they are in a stronger position than yep. they probably would have th- when we would have thought they would have been fair enough got there okay. eventually. Mm-hmm. young players to watch young players who might catch the eye and earn a move yeah uh i've mentioned him very briefly but uh ellis sakiri the 23 year old defensive midfielder slash infrequent center back he's only 23 he's only 23 years old Ooh. uh he plays for montpellier uh he has 
generally played as a holding midfielder for both uh, club and country, but I have seen him drop in and be a center back if the situation requires. Mm-hmm. But he is going to By the lead. Way, their center backs also just love to pass the ball out of the back. They're yes. So, yeah, so bold about Yassine it. Yassine Maria and Siam Ben Youssef will be the so. likely yeah. starters. Um, but yes, going back to Ellis Shakiri, uh, will lead in midfield, shield the defense, and link play, trigger that press that we've talked about. Again, Ellis, E L L Y E S. I'm going to assume that's Ellis. And uh, Sakiri, S K H I R I. All right. I will put, I've been doing this, I'll put mm-hmm. all the spellings of the main players we mentioned. Cool will be in the show notes just in case you forget who they are. Well, then right. why don't you add Naeem Sleety as well? We mentioned him <laughs> uh, uh, very briefly as a right winger, uh, right midfielder if you're going to drop not, him to a 4-5-1. Just yeah, uh, 25-year-old attacking midfielder for Dijon uh, in Ligue 1. Uh, seven goals and 31 appearances, playing as a number 10 uh, for them. Yeah, he's Here, a nice he'll be playing player, wide. I think. Yeah, uh, inexperienced at international level, but I think he will be very important for Tunisia because of the limited attacking options we've talked about. Okay, well, those are all very nice. Mm-hmm. But the correct answer to the mm-hmm. young player who will impress is a guy who probably isn't starting but may earn himself a spot. To be fair, I knew you were going to do this guy. <laughs> His name is Bassem Sarafri. Uh-huh. Bassem Sarafri, he mm-hmm. is 20 years old. He plays for Nice in France. Yeah. Not always, always plays for Nice. He's like a semi regular yeah. starter. Patrick Vieira is his new boss. Mm-hmm. Patrick Vieira is his new boss at Nice. This kid. Plays seems to be mostly on the right wing. He's left footed. There it is. That's why I knew you were going to pick him. He has fast little legs. Yep. Fast little legs and he will dribble at you and go at you. There are certain like patterns of play and moments in soccer that I love where it's just like he like this one specific move and then shot I love. I am working on a theory that Daryl Grove loves an inverted winger who does like the step over with the right foot, cuts inside and has the shot with the left foot, and that is exactly what I expect him to do on a consistent basis. I think it's because players like maybe I'm just biased from watching Messi do mm-hmm. it, right? Left footed from the right wing. But it feels to me that players who play on the right wing with their left foot and are willing to take risks and run at people cause all kinds of problems Mm -hmm. like think of iron robin continually left-footed right wing step inside shoot everybody knows he's going to do it no one can stop him doing it there's something about taking a facing a left-footed attack be it a dribble or a shot or a pass or whatever that players find hard to handle coming from that side i think it's just you're just so not used to that you're just so Mm -hmm. expecting the player to cut back and then try to cross because you if they're on the right side they're going to use their right foot it's what you do so i think if you're a defender even if you know he's going to do it that slight memory of like, oh yeah, he comes inside, isn't going to be nearly as strong as, oh, but every other time the player dribbles down the flank. So I'm going <laughs> to expect him to do that. And you can just be vulnerable as a result. So that the name of that player again was Bassem Sarafri. Mm-hmm. Um, he plays for Nice in Ligue 1. Mm-hmm. Okay, reason to support Tunisia. Any reason for US fans or any other fans to support Tunisia at the World Cup. I mean, other than avenging the Third Punic War? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the main reason, obviously. <laughs> I think, obviously. I believe Hannibal. Uh, Hannibal crossed the Alps with the elephants. I yeah. believe he was uh, from Carthage as well. Could oh, there be, we go. Could be very wrong. So you'd on be that, following though. in a rich tradition unless Taylor's wrong. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one reason to support them <laughs> could be that you really hate England. Yep. Because this is the tough game for England, I think. I think England can handle Panama, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it might be frustrating, but they'll. They'll get it done. Um, I think England versus Tunisia is the tough, 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 mm-hmm. tough game. Especially because that thing defensively, it's worth reminding people, of the way they show you inside into where all the bodies mm-hmm. are and then there's not a good way through to pass. That's the thing that England has traditionally struggled with is playing through a crowded midfield. They mm-hmm. are not good at it. Um, and there's also the fact that English fans and media will underestimate Tunisia because these players don't even play in the Premier League. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, man. I hadn't really thought about if if... You all were to lose to Tunisia. Mm-hmm. That is not going to be well received by the English press. No, it will not. So if you want the English press, say, yeah. all right, put it this way: say you are one of like the like the big. Yeah, if you're a fan of one of the big English teams and you don't want Harry Kane to be linked with a move to Real Madrid 400 times in the summer, just know that if England loses to Tunisia, that is all the tabloid press will be focused on. <laughs> so you won't get nearly as many nonsense rumors that will give you stress. There you go. <laughs> Another reason to support them. Yep. Um, they're right back. His name is Bron. Mm-hmm. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, that's yep. I think all you've got going for you at this World Cup yep <laughs> uh, well there is that one midfielder named Khaleesi there is not yes <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure there is and Whitley Brom was actually available he said he would play for any national team he just played for whoever was the highest bidder of course he's a self a self sword right back he just wants a castle <laughs> um, two other things mm-hmm. I think Tunisia culturally kind of cool yep here's two things that have happened Tunisia because they have a lot of young North African men they will have the finest and best sculpted facial hair at this entire tournament 
No arguments here. Right? Mm-hmm. I've seen – these are some very handsome men with some very thinly trimmed beards. Yep. It must take a lot of work. They, got, they have nice lines. They their li- nice their lines, lines are well done. Good, clean lines mm-hmm. on those Tunisian faces. And hard cut parts or whatever they are. Hard cut parts yeah. as well, yeah. Also, um, some people have been interested in uh, Muslim teams observing Ramadan yep. in the build-up to the World Cup. Um, there's a famous-ish story at this point when the two most re- – not the Spain-friendly, but the two friendlies before that. Um, a- after the sun went down, the goalkeeper goes down with a quote-unquote injury mm-hmm. um, and gets players uh, – the staff come on. He gets a drink and a few dates. All the other players go to the sideline, get some sort of Gatorade and a few dates. Um, he he very much made sure that they broke fast as soon as it was possible, even if it was mid-match. And it was weirdly charming to see that happen. I mean, I'm still confused by that, though, because isn't there the exception that if you're traveling? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, if we, we talk about this for a second, mm-hmm. I find this really interesting, right? There is, you can take an exception if you want, mm-hmm. right? As I understand it, it's just your own personal choice. But I think um, it has to be justified by you traveling. I think yes, that's part of it. Like, so. You can just be like, nah. But as I understand it, you mm-hmm. can just choose to be super observant mm-hmm. and just decide to do it anyway. And I've been working on this theory in my head. Right? I don't have any basis for this. I haven't interviewed mm-hmm. anyone about this. But I would bet that even though it's physically better for you to you know, eat and drink throughout the day, um, it may just be that if you like, really believe in fasting and that it's a thing that you want to do, there's a sort of mental purity or mental feel-good factor mm-hmm. to being observant throughout Ramadan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just worth pushing through to know that at the end of it, you feel like, yeah, I did it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But first, yeah, our goalkeeper's down. Now I can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a, a few people accused him of faking injury, and he, he kept tweeting back like, no, I was injured, bro. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, so there you go. There you yep. did, did you do, give your reasons, or did I just I ramble did. on for 10 minutes? I did. I did. So we're good. <laughs> we're good. All right. Then that brings us to our final team in Ooh. Group G, Ingerland. Ingerland, that mm-hmm. is the correct pronunciation. Mm-hmm. So no secret, this is my team. This is who I'll be supporting. This is who I'll be supporting. This is who you'll be supporting. All right. Um, this is probably going to be the longest, mandated by ancestry. the longest fourth team um, that we'll be talking about, the longest section of, for a fourth team in all of our World Cup previews. Decent chance this is a two-hour show. Decent chance at yep. that. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get to it. Sure. The nickname is The Three Lions. Yep. What do you think their nickname should be, Taylor? This is, I think... Primarily uh, reinforced by Southgate being the manager, but mm-hmm. I want them to be called the Corrells. The Corrells? Mm-hmm. As in Steve Carell? As in Steve Carell. Why so? Because Carell got his major break as a replacement for a popular but controversial Englishman who likes to drink. <laughs> I'm just saying, Ricky Gervais, Big Sam, it fits. Hence why when you said Big Ricky Gervais, I was like, uh-oh, he's on to me. Does Ricky Gervais like to drink? I mean, he drank at every, every one of the, was it Golden Globes that he hosted? Oh, he was always yes. drinking Fosters. I that see. Was his, yes, yeah. so I'm, I'm assuming he enjoys a can of lager. Uh-huh. Yeah, so got his major break repl- as a replacement for a popular but controversial Englishman who likes to drink. After a few seasons, he took a model we were all familiar with and fit the right pieces into it. So <laughs> then everybody started to be like, okay, well, yeah, this works, but it's only because he's a good comedic actor, probably not on a bigger stage. Then Foxcatcher in the Big Short. Wait, he's making interesting choices and 40 they're year, working. 40-year-old virgin? Well, 40-year-old virgin was a comedy. I'm saying yeah. that then we suddenly saw that he can be a dramatic actor oh, and maybe, because we all felt like, oh, yeah, on this stage, he can perform. Like in World Cup qualifying, in like comedies, that's where they're comfortable. But there's no way they can do dramatic work. There's no way they can perform at the World Cup. And I think they both can. So I think that England and Gareth Southgate are the Corrells. So if anyone does not, I love that, by mm-hmm. the way. If anyone doesn't know the Gareth Southgate backstory, yeah. he was the England under-21 coach. Didn't have a lot of managerial experience. I think he managed Middlesbrough at some point, semi-successfully. Um, Sam Allardyce got fired for uh, basically being recorded doing some slightly shady businessy things while he was England manager. Southgate took over. Uh, I don't think you need slightly in there, but sure. Southgate took over the job for him, and people were somewhat underwhelmed at the time. Yep. Now everybody is really up on Gareth Southgate because of what he's done over the past couple of years. I see, I agree with you, but I think there are still a significant number of outlets out there who know that negativity sells more papers. Mm-hmm. And so I still see a lot that's of why people... That's why they're picking on Raheem Sterling instead. Indeed. Yep. But I've seen some people say, like, oh, he hasn't even figured out who his best lineup is. Oh, he might change this. Like, no, he's not going to do that. And yes, he's figured out who his best players are. I, I find it very frustrating. And he frustrating. might change this, but that's all part of the plan. Yeah. We'll get to that I, so later. I just, I find that frustrating because I want to agree with you, except that I still see criticism and concern that I don't think is necessarily right. genuine. But it's at a much lower level than this previous is England this is very true. managers. Mm-hmm. Right? They're normally calling for managers to go before the World Cup has even started. Well, there is England that. is very much the Mexico of Europe. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so oh, while we're talking about Southgate, yeah. um, he looks like, to me, 
a 1930s newspaper reporter. You think? When he's got that waistcoat on, have you seen him at the most recent I don't two think he smokes enough. friendlies? Well, no, apart from that. And I've never seen a fedora. <laughs> Imagine a fedora on him, though. When he's got that waistcoat on and his side part in, mm-hmm. I think he looks like a 1930s newspaper reporter. Just imagine a little hat with the word press and a card sticking in it. There I'm, we go. I'm going to say he looks like Michael Vartan's English cousin, and that is a deep cut that is not going to resonate mm-hmm. with most people. But there you go. He's a brunette Michael Vartan. There you go. I don't know who that is. There you go. All right. We'll look it up, and then you'll be like, no, I disagree. Okay. The nickname is yeah. The Three Lions. Mm-hmm. I think it should be The 23 Lions. Okay. Here's why. So the three I'm lions. Preparing myself for nationalism. Go ahead. Three lions used to be apt, mm-hmm. right? Because so the the reason it's called the three lions is the crest mm-hmm. has three lions on it. Yep. And the third lion just shoved in there, very much squeezed in towards the bottom, and he's slightly misshapen because <laughs> someone ran out of room. I, right. I want to clarify this. This comes about because I made I made like some like hand burned coasters, and I made the the England crest, and Daryl sort of like very politely. Like made fun of it as like what happened to the third lion? Like why does or maybe my wife did when I showed it to you guys and I was like that's what it looks like. You're like no, it doesn't. And we pulled up a photo. Yes, it does. That the that, third, that lion third lion is crammed in there, squeezed into the yeah. bottom. But here's why that used to be mm-hmm. a very good representation of England. Yeah, because England used to be based on maybe three star players, but the third star player would be playing out of position. Yeah, and then that was part of the reason why England never quite functioned at a World Cup. Gareth Southgate has gone system. First, 100% system first, uh, celebrity name or star power second, and every player fits into the system. Agreed. That's why it's the 23 Lions instead of the three Lions. And I'll put it this way as well. Outside of the two goalkeepers who are not Jordan Pickford, every single player on this roster can realistically start a game. So 22 Lions and Danny Wabek? I think Danny Wabek could realistically I, I know. start he, a game. He can. That's just my menu. There is, there is no uh, Tyson... Mm-hmm. Um, or mixed discarude um, on this roster. You know what I'm saying? I mean, shots fired at mixed discarude. Every player selected, you could yeah. tell. I could tell you exactly where they fit into the system that Gareth Southgate wants to play. Yep. I think that's a major change for England, and I'm really, really excited about it. I 100% uh, agree with you, uh, and I think. The other interesting narrative I've seen is that like Gareth Southgate keeps making the tough decisions. Um, you know, he might not start Eric Dyer, no Jack Wilshire, uh, Walker moved inside. He got a lot of stick for that. Joe Hart not being on the roster, and it was all this like, oh man, he's making difficult decisions. And in reality, like, no, he's not. Like, he has a system that mm-hmm. he wants to play, and, and if people don't decisions. fit the system. That it's an easy decision, yeah, exactly. It's a really easy choice to make once you've decided the system comes first, not, oh, Joe Hart's played a bunch and he's kind of famous, I should pick him. Exactly. That's the thing is it removes the personal decision because mm-hmm. if it becomes a black and white, nope, this player can't execute this game plan, then they don't fit. And it's yep. not even, it doesn't matter what the name is. I wouldn't be surprised if Gareth Southgate has like a number system where he doesn't even look at the player names or who did what. He just looks and is like, okay, <laughs> like, yes, he performed to this percentage and that's what I need. So therefore he goes. So let's talk about that. And now he sounds like uh, Mark Baum from The Big Short. So there you go. Again, full circle. (laughs) Let's talk about England's system. Mm -hmm. Here's here's how I would describe it. 3-1-4-2. Yep. 3-1-4-2. So it's a back three. Yep. It's a back three, and England are going to pass out of the back in a way that they've never done at a major tournament. Mm -hmm. The, The priority was on defenders who could play the ball, who could pass the ball, who were very, very comfortable. That's why someone like Chris Smalling, who's defensively one of the best few defenders in England... Absolutely not even uh, in consideration because he can't play the ball out of the back. Ahead of the back three, there's a one. It's either Jordan Henderson or Eric Dyer. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? It's absolutely yep. in all the build-up. It's been Jordan Henderson or Eric Dyer. They're going to be the main outlet when the back three are playing out. Uh, two centre midfielders ahead of them, probably starting... Do you mind if I sort of do the team as I go? Nope. Uh, probably going to be Jesse Lingard and Deli Ali um, ahead of probably Jordan Henderson. Mm-hmm. And those guys are almost two number eights with real license to attack because Henderson's going to stay and when England attack, those two guys are free to go and find space and get involved in the attack, right? Agreed. Uh, real quick though, did you do your starting three centre backs? No, I kind of skipped over you it. skipped over that one. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. we'll come back to it. We'll come no, back to it. We'll no, let's to do another. All right, so Jordan Pickford in goal, mm-hmm. I believe, because he's the best with the ball at his feet, mm-hmm. right? That, I think that's the reason that he's the best selection. I think Joe Hart is crying right now, but sure. Yeah. Uh, then the back three, definitely John Stone's in the middle. Yep. Fascinating to me, John Stones has had a really rough season with Man City in terms of not being selected half the time. He is the best England player at taking the ball out of the back, at dribbling past someone, Mm -hmm. making a risky pass and uh, successfully completing it. That's why John Stones is the most important player on this England roster to me. If he goes down, the whole thing starts to fall apart. Um, I'd even say, okay, one of my 
one of my predictions is England will score a goal because John Stones ventures into midfield. I can see that. Because one of the things he does, he'll either, if there are no options on, he will kind of just take off and like, take the ball forward himself. Like, mm-hmm. oh, no one else is doing it. I'm going. Or here's what I see. He finds Jordan Henderson. Then he advances beyond Jordan he Henderson. The return pass. And you almost get a wall pass one, two thing going. And you've broken, broken away the, uh, the first wave of pressure. England have never had that. I am excited about it. And it's I'm not, getting carried away. I'll and it's, no, 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 no. I think it's fair. I mean, don't worry, because I'm right there with you. You are? Uh, okay. I'm, I'm glad it's not just me thinking that John Stones will be one, two in out of the back. Uh, no, well, no, I agree with you on that, but I'm maybe a little bit even more amped than you are about England. <laughs> but I think that's something where if you are a pressing team, if you're sending two forwards uh, ahead to press, you might try to block out that pass to Jordan Henderson. But if you can have that wall pass or a series of wall passes between your center back and that holding midfielder, you can absolutely, as you mm-hmm. said, you by- pre- bypass that pressure. And suddenly you've got advancing wide players. You've got possession in the middle with attacking numbers ahead of you. You're in a very strong spot. Mm-hmm. And even if you block off all the passing options, John Stones will just charge forward with the ball. Yep. So there's that as there's well. That. Mm-hmm. All right, so Stone's in the center, definitely. Mm-hmm. To his right, I'm very confident it will be Kyle Walker, which is kind of weird because he's a right back mm-hmm. <laughs> or a right wing back for Manchester City. He is going to play right center back for England. This, again, goes to Southgate's thing. Uh, the other, Apart from being able to play the ball at the back, one of the requisites for this England team is pace. Yep. This squad, with the exception of Harry Kane, who gets a special pass, <laughs> he gets a waiver, um, is full of pace. I've seen multiple times Kyle Walker, if England get broken on, he is fast enough to clean up the counter-attack because mm-hmm. he'll beat the attacking player to the ball. So yep. Kyle Walker at right centre-back. Um, left centre-back is the tougher one. It's either Harry Maguire or Gary Cahill. Harry Maguire slightly better with the ball. Gary Cahill the more experienced uh, central defender but not horrible with the ball. My money is on Gary Cahill, I, I think, agree. but it's an either or. It's an either yeah. or, yeah. Uh, Ryan Bailey, our former colleague at uh, the, the Goldmouth, Goldmouth. Yeah. Uh, he has suggested that maybe you see Eric Dyer drop yeah. in into that. But I think that is primarily based on number one, the idea that, I mean, yeah, he's a holding midfielder who can obviously pass play oh, for left Pochettino. Yeah, yeah, left center back. Number two is maybe. It goes back to that old model of, like, you want to put your best 11 on the field. I kind of think if Roberto Martinez were in charge of England, that might be where <laughs> Eric Dyer starts. I don't think it's where he starts for Gareth Southgate. Okay, so you got your back three. Yep. Ahead of them, as I said, another key position mm-hmm. is, I think it's Jordan Henderson. It could be Eric Dyer. Yep. Henderson's the better passer by a distance. Henderson's the better organizer. You see him talking to everybody. He's mm-hmm. captain when Harry Kane's not there. He acts like a captain anyway in terms of talking to everybody, directing traffic in terms of where defensively they are and where the ball should go as they're passing it out of the back. Yep. Um, if it's a more defensive game, Eric Dyer's the much better defender, but not as good a passer. I think, That's honestly, the weird trade-off. Honestly, I think if it's a more defensive game, then both of them are in there. That, that oh, wouldn't be surprised to see something like that adjustment yeah, yeah. where you maybe even go to like a 3 4 2 one, yeah. and then you've got those two gentlemen playing midfield That's possible for you. too. Mm-hmm. Okay, then we said ahead of Henderson, it's Lingard and Ali, like finding space, causing trouble. Both guys very good at finding space. Out wide, yeah. I think Danny Rose on the left, maybe Ashley Young. I have Ashley Young. On the right, it's Kieran Trippier. I have Kieran Trippier. Or it's Trent Alexander-Arnold, Yep. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go. There's your team. And then your two uh, midfield substitutes would be Fabian Delph and Ruben Loftus Cheek. Yes. We didn't mention ahead of them Raheem Sterling, Harry Kane. Yep. And I've been thinking of this as Sterling underneath Kane. Yep. I've been rewatching some England. It's basically a front two because mm-hmm. quite often I see Sterling as the farthest forward player and Harry Kane come in underneath. Mm-hmm. It's basically a two man forward line. Yeah. It works. I, I think it works too. Mm-hmm. I'm a little worried that Sterling has played on the wing his whole season at City and now he's asked to play centrally. But I still think he's going to be really scary when he's running at people. Uh, you yeah. will get no arguments from me, which is why one of my predictions uh, is that Raheem Sterling will have a moment of magic against Panama. Sorry to keep picking on Panama, but I think that's the team where it's most likely uh, because he's capable of being very clever and dribbling through center backs. Mm-hmm. He has a lovely bit of skill. He has obviously very many skills, but yeah. I could see a lovely bit of skill that leads to a penalty. He has a good swerve and a good quick change Quick, sharp change of direction. And I could see with that a Michael Owen-esque breakaway that showcases <laughs> his like speed but his ability to control the ball under pace. Yeah. And I think really what this comes from is Christian Pulisic against... Uh, Panama. I was just thinking that. When he just, he blazed through. He just like, he got a little flick on from, like, I could just see this exact scenario in which, uh, say, uh, Jordan Henderson goes up for a header, flicks it on to Harry Kane, who lays it off to Raheem Sterling. Raheem Sterling bursts through the two center backs, gets a shot, gets a goal. That is literally what the United States did against Panama for their first goal. Yep. That I could see that sequence. Uh, if maybe England did go for a long ball or two to try to bypass Panama's midfield, maybe you'll see that happen. And I think a moment of magic from, from Raheem Sterling 
doing it against Panama is very likely. All right. And then the English tabloids will have to eat it. Mm, they probably will. <laughs> Actually, I saw an interesting point about the... So, if, for people who don't know, Raheem Sterling has been the subject of a lot of derogatory headlines from English tabloids mm-hmm. about how much money he earns, about a tattoo he got, and just variously, like, disapproving of his Wasn't various... like, when he eats? Lifestyle like that? choices. Yeah, just think of he... Uh, Eats breakfast the day after Man City lose, as if he shouldn't have eaten breakfast. Yeah, it's a very, very Odd. dumb headline. Interesting thing, it's never the back page, it's the front page, right? So the sports editors are not going after Raheem Sterling. Oh, it's I see. It's the front page, tabloidy, newsy, we, almost we, National Enquirer level type gotcha. thing. Okay, because yeah. I, don't, I don't know the difference there. So is that what it is? Basically, back yeah. page is sports, front page is theoretical yes, every, news? every tabloid newspaper in England works that way, yeah, gotcha. front to back. I always pick it up from the back. <laughs> I, you probably As, should. Yeah. <laughs> if you have to pick it up at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I've got a. Oh, we took Harry Kane as well. Sure. I think Harry. I don't have it as a prediction. I think Harry Kane's going to have a great tournament. Okay. I'm really impressed with Harry Kane. We talked about how he's not that quick. Harry Kane only needs a tiny bit of space to fire a shot on target. He's very good at just taking a touch and taking you by surprise and putting it in the bottom corner. Here's my question Are you concerned about. How much he has played in the past couple of years combined with the return from injury, do you think he is as sharp as he could have been had that injury not have happened? Do you think he's at 100% going into this tournament? I am optimistic that mm-hmm. he is. I understand that it's not. He's my one big question mark. I think he's not at that level where, was it the start of this past season where he just couldn't stop scoring? Mm-hmm. Yeah, It's not goals galore, but I think I've got no reason to worry about him, if yeah. that makes sense. Okay, that yeah. does make sense. So like 90% Harry Kane is fine for me. Yep. Yeah. I, I think you need, you England, need uh, Harry Kane to score against Tunisia. I think it's fundamentally important because mm-hmm. if Harry Kane has a bad game, if he gets subbed out in the 60th minute or plays all 90 but Jamie Vardy has to come in, what you don't want to happen is opening the door for people to be very overt in their criticism of what Gareth Southgate is doing, or I don't think it's likely, but Gareth Southgate to think, mm, maybe Jamie Vardy starts the next game. And once yeah. you go down that road as a manager of, maybe this guy instead of that guy, maybe this guy instead of that guy, suddenly all the plans that you've worked to put in place can kind of fall by the wayside. I agree. And that it was Euro 2016. Euro 2016 mm-hmm. was, I think, Kane started sometimes, um, yeah. Sturridge started sometimes, Vardy maybe one yep. time. It got very confusing. Rashford to... didn't start, but I think was always the impact sub. Mm-hmm. So, I think, and I think that'll be the same again, by the way. Marcus it, Rashford, I think, will be coming off the bench yeah. to do what he does best, which is not pass, dribble at people, shoot from, <laughs> shoot from optimistic distances. I think that's probably yeah. a safe bet. <laughs> but I, I think it's very important that Harry Kane gets off to a very strong start. Yes. And he did that... In his England debut, right? Didn't he score like 37 seconds into his debut? Something remember. like that. It's been so long. I think, I, he scored, I think he scored on his debut. So yeah, we just need to keep, he's only, keep doing that. He's only 24. That's young. Only 24. It was decent. English Lukaku. <laughs> um, so have you got any predictions for me? Uh, yeah, so I've done the Raheem Sterling one. My other one is that England will top the group. Ooh, That wow. is my prediction. That's optimism. Mm-hmm. That's the first time we've made a group prediction it as well. It is. Um, I am fully aware that this might be homerism. I have a hard time spotting significant vulnerabilities that could lead to problems in the group, at least. I think at the very least they get out. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to admit that maybe I have blinders. I don't think that I do. But I think Gareth Southgate has put the players in the positions in which they're most comfortable, or at least very comfortable. It's a lot of positions where these players are playing for their club teams, and they're playing, for the most part, similar styles to what England are going to be doing. It is... I feel very confident about this England team in a way that I'm not necessarily comfortable with, but I think that they seem very unified. The same way. There you go. Yeah. They seem very unified with a clear idea of how they're playing. They've got possible backup plans. It's not just this better work or we're in trouble. I do yep. think that they've got alternative options. I think if you look at their defense, it kept Germany, Brazil, and the Netherlands goalless. So it's far more solid than I think a lot of previews are indicating because there are some question marks. Yep. But I think it's mostly just these two are... Both very good. We're not sure which one will be chosen. It's not the best of a bad scenario. And finally, I think that Belgium are still figuring things out a little bit. They did just smash Costa Rica and looked very, very good. But I think you can have those vulnerabilities. And if things don't go well against Panama, or maybe there's just a few question marks, I think Belgium might struggle a little bit more. And I think England are uniquely positioned to be able to handle Belgium. Here are my two major worries. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of which is tactical and one of which is emotional, both for me and for the players. Right. So tactically, I do worry about the playing out of the back thing. Because mm. I've seen, um, I can't remember if it was Netherlands or Italy, games that went well in the end, friendlies uh, for England, where in the early, like first five minutes, there was a hiccup. There was John Stones dribbling, got tackled, and Kyle Walker had to rescue mm. him, or Jordan Pickford had to rescue yeah. him. There were passes out of the back that were 
overly optimistic and went astray and the other team came back at them there is a chance that England go into this tournament feeling very good about oh we're now we're the team that plays out of the back and that could go wrong mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying and then the whole confidence is all the confidence is shaken and maybe they're just timid doing it and then the whole thing falls apart right? yeah the other version of that is um I'm confident that this team has more movement in it. It has more Lingard and Deli Ali finding space and Sterling floating around in a way that the Iceland game won't happen again. But if it does, if for some reason Tunisia throttle us with all those bodies in midfield and we can't pick our way through, I could see the psychological pressure all returning, all the ghosts of England past <laughs> come back to haunt this current England team, even though they started with all this confidence. Mm. So I think basically they're, they're one bad game away or one bad result away from having the same problems as the old England teams because all that old stuff comes rushing back. Do you but, that, think, but that's a, an emotional worry that I have maybe more than the players Do you have. think that's unique to England, though? Because I do feel like that could be said for a lot of different teams. Like Belgium, for example, who yeah. have flamed out in tournaments past. Mm-hmm. If a result doesn't go their way, I could. I feel like the same thing could happen to yeah, Belgium. I so I, I guess I guess I'm, I'm not trying I'm not to, Belgium. I'm, I'm not trying to <laughs> I'm not trying to like therefore say like since so that point is not valid. It's just more so like yeah, I think that is kind of the curse of playing in such a prominent tournament and such yeah. like a high profile tournament that you're keenly aware that one mistake and yeah. then suddenly all that confidence buckles. But like Germany don't let that sort of thing worry them, right? They have maybe one game where it's really hard to break mm-hmm. someone down, then the next game they're back and they're firing and it's all happening. Like mm. England, I think it could be the thing that topples them. So that Tunisia game is huge for me. An early goal is huge against Tunisia. Then what even, I a, s- even a late goal. Any goal is huge against Tunisia. I, might, I agree with that. But what I might disagree with you on is that I don't think it extends to, in my opinion, it doesn't extend to if they fail to break down Tunisia. If they struggle and only get a couple shots off and it's a nil-nil game, Yeah, I don't necessarily know if that has the psycholo- psychological impact as maybe missing a penalty or maybe like like having three bad passes out of the back to start the game. I think you're right there that specific moments that either like harken back to historical drama or maybe make them wonder, ooh, is this foundation as solid as we thought? I think that is where the vulnerabilities could be. If they struggle to break down teams, maybe a little bit of that, but I think it's more so Gareth Southgate has the ability to say, okay, then we're going to try to adjust this, we're going to change this, and not just we'll put on Marcus Rashford and hope he scores from 30 yards out. Well, I, I hope you're right. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I've got another prediction. What you got? This is based on a, some detailed watching. Are you ready? England will score with an in-swinging free kick. Okay. So, all of England's free kicks, they're non-shooting, they're crossing free kicks mm-hmm. from re- recent games, for at least the past three games, have been taken uh, from an inverted side. Okay. Meaning, if the free kick is on the left, Kieran Trippier and his right foot goes over there and takes the free kick, right? So normally, or quite often, a free kick served into the box is Mm outswinging, right? It goes into, it bends in towards the keeper to tempt him, and then goes back out a little bit, like, towards the back post, Mm -hmm. right? England have decided all their free kicks are in-swinging and hit sort of viciously. So they Mm -hmm. whip in in in-swinging free kicks and try and get a flick on um, at the, what would be the near post, but everything's maybe at the top of the penalty Mm -hmm. area. That causes, it's ugly, it's horrible to look at. It's really not very nice aesthetically, right? But it causes chaos and England have committed to it. And I like the idea that England have a design set piece. Uh, Yeah, I I don't think corners, unless you're Welsh, I don't think corners are particularly pretty to begin with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not corners. Corners they take out, Mm -hmm. corners they take um, out swinging. I I guess, I mean, any any situation which you're putting a ball into the box, it's never going to be that aesthetically pleasing. True, yeah, yeah. But but do they do that um, like forsaking shooting? Like if it's a shooting opportunity, no. Will I mean, they if it's still... central okay. and like twenty five yards out, then okay. someone's hitting mm-hmm. it. Yeah. You don't have a cross to the back post no, on, no, no, on no. a free kick. No. All right. But every time the ball is wide, every uh-huh. time the free kick is wide, which happens a lot, right? Because wingers get fouled. They take um, inverse foot and in swinging free kick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So do you think? So where are you then? Do you think there's a chance that England top the group? Do you think I'm just yeah, losing my mind? Yeah, definitely a chance they top the group. Yeah. yeah. I won't guarantee it. Daryl Grove just guaranteed it. All right, England to top the group. We both predict that 100%. How about Mm -hmm. young player to watch? Who's your young player to watch for England? It's it's a little bit difficult. So are we doing young player or are we doing player who might get a move? Player who might get a move. Because I think the only real, like, likely candidate is uh, Danny Rose. 
you mentioned him earlier. I don't know if he starts. I think there's a chance that Ashley Young has played his way into a starting spot. Danny Rose has not played his way into a starting spot with Tottenham. Uh, there's been a lot of drama. He's wanted to move. He's a 27-year-old, so it's kind of the time to do it. And I think if, even if he doesn't have a great tournament, I think that could be used as a reason for him to further justify getting a move away from Tottenham. If he does play well, if he does start, then I think maybe the line of suitors increases. You get a little bit of a bidding war. Maybe Tottenham are more inclined to sell him for that reason. Interesting. Okay. Danny Rose did a really good interview recently uh, that I saw. Did you you Mm -hmm. read about this? So England did what they called a Super Bowl style thing where all the players were in a room and you did like a speed dating thing with the media. They talked to Yeah, media day. Media day, right? England had never done this before. It's part of maybe a new thing that Southgate was trying. Danny Rose told, I believe it was Miguel Delaney of The Independent, who's a really good writer. I really like him. um, That basically when he was at Tottenham and he was coming back from that injury, um, he made a couple of oblique references that Tottenham didn't treat him that well. Mm-hmm. He basically said it made him depressed, yep. right, in a clinical kind of way. And that going away with England was his relief. Yep. His professional relief when he was happiest was when he got called into the England squads. The reason that interests me is, one, it's really big for a famous England player to be talking openly about depression. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, it's usually the opposite. A lot of I remember Jamie Carragher always talking about like he loved it at Liverpool, wasn't so keen on going away with England. Mm. It's the inverse of what normally happens in terms of club versus country for England. But if you yeah, but if you think about a lot of these guys, I'm not that surprised by that because I think that's the same sentiment we'll hear from some of the U.S. players that we just talked about playing against France. If you have that sort of if England to you or the United States to you is, oh, I get to go hang out with my buddies, we'll play weird games, Weston McKinney's going to flick me in the ear, uh, like you look at it more as like an opportunity to get together with your friends. We'll argue about who's fastest. Obviously that too. That was a little <laughs> bit tense. Um, but I do think that that makes sense then, that if you have this opportunity to finally, it's not competitive against each other, it's competitive as a team, you get to hang out with your friends. I totally see that as mm-hmm. Uh, a welcome relief from a very competitive Premier League season. Yeah, so there you go. Mm-hmm. Danny Rose, yeah, it's a, it's a good shout. I hope he has a great tournament. Did he also, was he the one who said he wasn't going to bring his family to Russia, or was that a different England player? Or he was telling them to stay home? That might have been Raheem Sterling? I can't remember. I, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, e- I think either it might way, have been Danny Rose. I think either way, I, I like the, the outspokenness and the directness, mm-hmm. so I appreciate that. My player that I think will get a move from this tournament is Ruben Loftus-Cheek. Mm-hmm. Ruben Loftus-Cheek is 22 years old. He is still a Chelsea player, but he spent the last season on loan at Crystal Palace. Oh, see, this is when I get annoyed when people list the rosters. Because I think I I took one from one of the official roster release sites or whatever, but it listed him as a Crystal Palace player. So I assumed, same thing with uh, Batshuayi in uh, Belgium, that they listed him as a Dortmund player, but he's Mm -hmm. a Chelsea player. I thought Loftus-Cheek had already made that move permanent. Ruben Loftus-Cheek's contract at Chelsea goes until 2021. Okay. Here's a great thing I read about Ruben Loftus-Cheek. Um, on Football 365. Mm. So Chelsea sent him out on loan, right? Even though he's come through the club uh, academy, or at least he's you know been there a long time. They signed Bakayoko to play central midfield. They signed Danny Drinkwater to play central midfield. And then they signed Ross Barkley to play centre midfield for a combined cost of well over 100 million. None of those three have made a World Cup squad. Ruben Loftus-Cheek went to Crystal Palace, lit it up, made England's World Cup squad. What an absolute waste of money when you had Ruben Loftus-Cheek there all along. I, those things you just said are shocking to me. Mm-hmm. I, wow. All right, then. All right. Especially the Drinkwater and Barkley signings. Why would you need those guys when I could tell you Ruben Loftus-Cheek is a better player than both of them? Could, honest question. Do you think you could have when they signed Danny Drinkwater? Because I'm not sure you could have. I, again, true. I think there's a little bit of... All right, well, someone at Chelsea should have been able to tell This me. is definitely true. <laughs> but I think there's a little bit of similar to when you asked me, like, which players from the U.S.-France game should be yeah, yeah. Uh, should have been starting against Trinidad. It's tough to know at the time because yeah. w- with retrospect, oh, my gosh, this guy's been playing and he's amazing. But I think with all that said, I 100% agree with you that either he gets a move in the sense that he goes back to Chelsea and gets more of an opportunity to start, mm-hmm. or he gets a move to a place where they will love and respect him and let him start every game. <laughs> so and if nothing thing. else, he can always go back to England duty where he feels most comfortable. So England are already missing what would have been a starting central midfielder mm-hmm. in Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, right? Mm-hmm. So they're already down to their second choice in Ali and Lingard. Yep. If either of those guys gets tired, injured, suspended... Ruben Loftus-Cheek is next in line to play central midfield, I believe. I think he's ahead of Fabian Delft. If you're going with that role, I would agree. Yeah, but if, if then, if one of those got injured and Gareth Southgate said, okay, never mind, we're going to lock it down and have two defensive midfielders, I yes. would see that as possible too. Ruben Loftus-Cheek um, has silky, silky 
feet. Mm. He has consistent passing. I think he had 100% pass completion um, in the game, the last friendly. Why can't I remember who they played? Costa Rica. They played Costa Rica. 100% pass completion. Um, Really sort of trustworthy in terms of not losing the ball, but also very creative and runs at people, draws people in and then lays the ball off. He opens things up for other people. Mm. Marcus Rashford. Remember the Marcus Rashford goal against Costa Rica from distance? Tough to forget. It's Ruben Loftus-Cheek who does a little move and then plays it into him. Right. So he's, I think he's a very important player. Gareth Southgate is a huge fan. Worked with him at under-21 level, mm-hmm. which is part of that whole uh, Southgate relationship with the younger players thing. Trusts him a lot. I think we see Ruben Loftus-Cheek start at least one game, enter at least a couple games, and impress so much that Chelsea, the new manager, maybe sorry, either has to say, yeah, you're going to start, you're part of my first team plans, or he gets a move to a bigger team. And he's 22 years old, mm-hmm. which is kind of insane. I think it's in the Crystal Palace is what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you meant. I know what you meant. Um, yes, so I think, I think that's a safe bet. And then in terms of just youngsters to keep an eye on, um, in uh, increasing order, ascending order would be the one, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold, 19, Marcus yes. Rashford, 20, Dele Alli, 22, Raheem Sterling, 23. Wow. Yeah. Yes. So you've got some talent there to come, Daryl. I'm interested to see how Trent Alexander-Arnold does. He had the, he, his debut was against Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. So yep. he's got one cap and he's off to the World Cup. Yeah, Pretty I think it's deal. a completely defensible decision, though. I think he. Oh yeah, no, he's yeah. absolutely earned mm-hmm. that. Uh, absolutely earned that spot, right? And maybe we see him. Although I think you could. Maybe you'll see him very late in games mm-hmm. when Trippier needs a change, or maybe if Kyle Walker can't then switch over to right back, then yeah, maybe that's where we see Trent Alexander Arnold. And as soon as TAA steps on the mm-hmm. field. He is capped out to England, cannot play for the United States of America. Mm -hmm. But if you're an American fan who's looking for a reason to watch, maybe Trent Alexander-Arnold doesn't get a cap. Maybe he gets a little (laughs) bit frustrated by that. Maybe suddenly he starts looking at the USA and thinks, yeah, that seems fine. That seems fine. (laughs) He's just part of the great fullback exchange of 2018. That is Anthony Robinson for Trent Alexander-Arnold. Okay, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. (laughs) We traded Scouse fullbacks. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, and then I think for uh, other reasons to watch uh, England, if you're an American fan, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of Americans um, first started watching the Premier League. I think that's how maybe many Americans, myself included, mm-hmm. got into soccer to begin with, aside from just playing at rec level. So I think it makes sense to watch the players that you're most familiar with or that you have the strongest relationship with. Highest percentage of Premier League players. In mm-hmm. the entire World Cup. Yeah. Mostly because English players are scared to go abroad, but highest percentage of Premier League players. I guess that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't yeah. surprise me then. <laughs> yes. Um, other reasons to support mm-hmm. this England team. This is finally a likable England team. Yep. There are no sort of uh, Charlie Big Potatoes, look at me, look at me type mm-hmm. players, right? It's not an arrogant Charlie team. Charlie Big Potatoes? Yes. Charlie is that Big the potatoes. height of luxury where you're from? <laughs> no, it's Big the... Potatoes, man. He's demanding Big Potatoes. Potatoes are a stand in for something okay. else. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Another reason I um, made Daryl uncomfortable. We invented it. It's yep. about time we were good at it oh, again. Oh my god! All right, so now we're going down this route. But let's let's support the country that invented it. Actually, being good at football again. Let's hope that that happens. I hear Scotland invented it. I mean, they helped. They helped. <laughs> um, oh no! See, we've we've gone from us trying really hard to be like objective and say these are the reasons why we think England could do well, and now I feel like you've just veered straight up into <laughs> England's the best. <laughs> I mean, that was semi tongue in cheek, but, but only semi. Daryl left, left the room and came back with like the St. George's cross painted on his face. It was surprising <laughs> to see. I didn't see that coming. Anything else to add um, about this England team? No, I mean, other than that, again, I'm very excited to see them play. I think they could do uh, certainly get out of the group. I think they could win the group. I think that we should expect exciting things from them. And they're one of the teams that I'm most excited to watch at this tournament. All right, there you go. All three Lions, consider yourself previewed. Fully previewed. Including the uncomfortable one in the bottom. Yes, including the uncomfortable one at the bottom, who is also welcome. Yep. Um, all right, Taylor, we previewed Group G. We did it. We did it. There is one more World Cup group to go. Group H, we will preview that tomorrow. So Tuesday night, right? Tuesday night is our Group H preview. Look out for I'm that. Look at the clock right now and... My friend, I believe you mean tonight we'll be previewing it. <laughs> oh, you're the kid that John Mulaney throws out of <laughs> sleepovers. <laughs> Take your EpiPen. I'm pretty sure John Mulaney doesn't throw anybody anywhere. <laughs> have, you seen, yeah. have you seen that stuff? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm just saying physically, I don't think he's chucking anybody <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> but yes, people that do that. Yeah. Um, and then Wednesday, we'll do essentially a weird like World Cup excitement preview, right? So <laughs> in the, we'll talk about Russia, Saudi Arabia <laughs> and what to watch for in that game. Yeah. That's what we're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. We're going to be telling people, here's what to watch for in the games that are coming up. Um, but also just the other weird stuff that we haven't talked about, maybe the ball, you know, the World Cup ball. 
Yes, yeah, I was very confused this? for a minute. Yeah. Apparently goalkeepers are a little unhappy about uh-huh. the ball. We'll talk about VAR, maybe some breakout players to watch. Like all the reasons to get excited about the World Cup that isn't profiling Tunisian tactics. No Vuvuzelas. No uh-huh. Vuvuzelas, yeah. So yeah, we'll do a preview on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. With me? With you. I hope so. I'll be talking to no one. That would be weird. Not. All right. Taylor Rockwell, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, Thank you for listening and thank you for sharing. So many listeners have shared the show recently on Twitter, by word of mouth, all that kind of stuff. The show really is uh, spreading. People are finding it ready for the World Cup. Please keep doing that. It means a lot to us. It helps us out. It means that Total Soccer Show is uh, an ongoing concern and Mm -hmm. can continue to be so after the World Cup. And to paraphrase John Hamm, if you find another uh, American soccer or American based podcast covering the World Cup out there, keep it to yourself. (laughs) That's harsh, but I agree with it. (laughs) Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow.